at the work of the BBC following the government's midterm review, licence fee increase and ongoing funding review. We're joined by Tim Davey, the Director General, Lee Travazia, Tra Tra Travazia, Sorry, Lee. How do I pronounce your surname? Trabaziva. Trabaziva, the Chief Operating Officer, and David Jordan, Director of Editorial Policy and Standards. You're all welcome. Thank you so much Thank for you. coming in, Lee. I do apologise about that. I have an unspellable, unpronounceable surname myself, so it's completely unforgivable <laughs> from me, but you're all very welcome. Uh, before we begin, can I just ask if any members would like to declare any interests? Um, occasionally in, in receipt of uh, royalties from the BBC. Uh, for Thank a BBC you. journalist. I have received hospitality by the BBC at various times over the years. I've, uh, I'm a former BBC employee in, in various manifestations, and as of yesterday, I chair the all-party group on the BBC. Congratulations. I'm a former BBC uh, reporter and uh, presenter, and uh, I've worked with uh, David Jordan on uh, many groundbreaking uh, films uh, during my period there, and I've received uh, BBC hospitality uh, more recently. Uh, same as Ms Elliot. BBC on the so occasionally over the years. Yeah, I went to a BBC gig and a long time ago I was on the payroll in the 90s. Just a pleb. Nonsense. <laughs> 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 I'm sure I've also received hospitality yeah. from the BBC. Oh, yeah. so Sorry, so have I. Yes, yeah. mm. uh, you're all welcome. So we've, now, we've, now we've got that off our chests. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for coming in. Um, Mr Davey, can I start with you? Mm. The Secretary of State said <coughs> there's a perception among the BBC that the BBC, among, among the public, that the BBC is biased. Do you agree with her? Um, overall, if you look at the midterm review, and if I may, just, just one sentence, because we are here for the midterm review, um, just I thought the process was extremely well con conducted and we support the conclusions and it's a very uh, helpful piece of work. Um, if you look at the, I mean, I turn to the midterm review. The, the midterm review shows clear evidence that, you know, the focus and the adherence to impartiality <coughs> and editorial standards is now at the heart of our priorities and what we've got to deliver. I am <coughs> proud of our output under huge pressure, and I think we look at the data as well, which we can come to. Um, overall, we're doing a good job in terms of delivering uh, impartial coverage amidst enormous pressure. One of the things I talk a lot about is 70% of the world now does not have a free press. The polarisation in society is profound. So any institution like ourselves to steer the course amongst the noise, the storms of social media is very demanding. But actually, if you look at the Ofcom research in terms of trust, in terms of arguments, <coughs> we're holding firm in the midst of a situation where actually public institutions, and I worry about this, are losing trust. So I believe we are impartial and we're doing a good job, but I do not for a minute, and I think people who know me know this, uh, want to be defensive or complacent about that. I think there's lots of work to do. The other thing I'd say, if I may, is I think we focus on the output and the delivery against that. We're not perfect, but I think we're doing a good job. Then we also, perception is relevant, but it comes after the delivery of impartiality in terms of our coverage and how we work. Our perception tracking it remains strong, and we're seen as the number one source for impartial news. But we've also got people on either side the political fence, although I think it gets more complicated as we go into issues, that believe the BBC is leaning one way or the other. Final point for me was the other thing we've got to deal with, I think we've got to be considerate and more transparent in explaining our workings, because what we are seeing is a quite disturbing trend globally where people are constantly trying to ascribe intent. So people will watch the same, we're getting more evidence. We've talked about this with editorial policy and others, where you, you see the same piece of, piece of coverage and read it very differently based on where you come from and your echo chamber. So sometimes we're gonna to have to do even more work to say, look, I'm just asking you a question to find out what's happening. And look, we've got work to do, but I think overall we're doing a good job. So what has the midterm review changed on your, of your view of and how you manage impartiality? I think it challenges us to um, continually, we can talk about some of the specifics, but challenges us to be robust in implementing things like the Sorota review and the 10 point plan we had, which are material. If members of the committee read the thematic review on tax and public spending, we're, we're just about to get to a migration um, thematic review, which is a really interesting read. These are not easy topics, but they're also topics that demand 
calm, contextualised journalism. And I think we're doing a good job, but there's loads of things in there. If you read that Tax and Public Spending Review that I think are really useful for journalists. If you edit through the Today programme, and they're very good people, these people. I mean, I think we get a lot of noise around us, we'll talk about it, but if you talk to the editor of the six and the ten, I won't name them all, but they're good people, and they're, they're of the highest quality, but sometimes you need to step back and think about what the midterm review says is, do the thematic reviews, be open-minded about complaints, which I'm, I mean, the BBC's got a long-running criticism of, you know, kind of auto-defence. That is not my style. I actually think we should be listening, we should be reflecting on where we get criticism, and the midterm review says very clearly that we also need a very robust procedure, and we split out, as you know, and says we'll come to complaints, I'm sure, at some point, I guess, um, the post-broadcast complaint system and making sure there's increasing trust in that, and we need the trust in that, and that's a good challenge for the midterm review. You spoke about the review on uh, migration. What's the status of that one? When is that likely to come forward? Uh, I th we're <coughs> taking it to the board this week. So subject to approval, that then goes to... So it's it, not far away, imminent in terms of... It's been written. It's um, uh, through the Editorial Guidelines and Standards Committee and it will go to the board this week. So I think we're just about there. And what other reviews have you got planned? We're yet to confirm our next big thematic review, um, and we'll come back to you. Yeah, obviously, we'll make public when we've decided what the topic is. That's being discussed at the moment. In October, the BBC board issued a statement on the Israel-Gaza war that referred to a review of the editorial guidelines that was planned to take place in the spring. Has yeah. that taken place? Yeah. I mean, I wonder if David can give us, if, uh, the, can give us a, a detail on where we are in terms of standards. So the, the reference was to a particular part of the review of the editorial guidelines. There are people in this room who know quite a lot about reviews of editorial guidelines, but just for the benefit of, of others, uh, we, we, we do this every four or five years. We have a look at the editorial guidelines and whether they're fit for the purpose currently. We review them in terms of changes in the law, changes in the Off Common Code, changes in audience expectations, all of those kinds of things. And we go through a process each time, which starts with me and with my team looking at all of the feedback we've had over the previous four to five years in relation to, to implementing the guidelines. We then update them in, in, in relation to that. And after we've been through that process and consulted our lawyers and similarly and people in-house, in we then go to a more general consultation with everybody in the, in the BBC, and we're at that point at the moment. When we've finished doing that, which will be, we, we want those comments in by the end of this month, it would take us a little while to, to build them into the, to the latest draft. When we've got the latest draft of that, we'll then take that to a public consultation, which will happen in this spring, which will last for six weeks and give an opportunity to everybody. And we don't just do that reactively. We don't just, as it were, put it on our website and ask people to comment. We proactively send the draft to a lot of, of, of stakeholder organisations and indeed to political parties and, and, and others and ask them positively for comment. When we finished all that process, we obviously take that into account and we have then take that draft back to the board which ultimately signs this off. Hopefully we'll do that in the first part of the autumn and when they've agreed to it, we then go to on to, to, to publish uh, in it, hopefully before we get to the next general election, but you'll know more about whether that's likely than I do. So we have a process, and the bit that you're referring to was the public consultation, which is coming up next. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Um, so, Mr. Davy, back to my original question. The Secretary of State said there is a perception amongst the public that the BBC is biased. Was she being unfair? Um, well, she was sharing a personal perspective, and I get a lot of personal perspective. What I look at is the date, when we look at the date, the overall data on the BBC, the perception of impartiality remains strong, but for on either side of a strong score, you've also got people who view us to go one way or the other, and we continue to work on that. Yeah, I, I want to come in on the back of the Israel Gaza coverage mm. because the ICJ hearing yeah. several weeks ago was a hugely significant uh, yeah. news item. The, the, the channel that has replaced the news channel, the, there was hardly any of the South African submission on day one, and yet hours and hours of the Israeli submission on day two. Um, have you looked into the disaster that that was in terms of impartiality, because it wasn't impartial? We've had lots of, as you know, I get feedback yeah. of... Um, 
significant feedback from people on either side, if we can simplify even as either side on this uh, in this. I don't think there's two conflict. sides to this. I think there's on, an on issue that, of that impartiality. I mean, and David, may, David may um, look at it, but we did cover in detail that ruling. And, I watched it, all of it. And yeah, but we, I'm just talking about on one outlet in terms of we can debate the ins and outs of that. But overall, I think we've been pretty robust in covering the ICJ um, proceedings. So you think it was fair to have a tiny bit of the South African submission and then switch to the post office, which again is a very, very important story. I think I'm not o uh, that. overall... But then have hours and hours the next day of the other side submission. You think that was fair and impartial? Well, I think on a rolling news channel, you've got, in terms of selections, in terms no, of what's no. going... Do you think that was fair and impartial I think, I, I think, and balanced? <coughs> I think overall, when you look at our coverage on the rulings, we've been in a reasonable position. David, do you think it was fair and impartial? The coverage of those two days of hearings I'm talking about, not the yeah, rest of I, the I think, I think you've put your finger on something very important about what happened, because mm -hmm. it only happened on our UK output. The, the, the international output covered the two sides of that conflict and of the presentations that were made to the ICJ. They, 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 they covered them equally in our international coverage. But in our UK coverage, because the hearing on the post office was being held at the same time, they made the editorial decision to go with the post office coverage rather than the other coverage, which, as you can tell, was a very difficult decision to make. Uh, when, they looked at it in, when they looked at it, when news looked at it in retrospect, they did think that perhaps they'd made a mistake in not making the two, the two live coverage events similar or the same but they did make all the other coverage was very similar the same and was very very comprehensive so it was just about the live coverage on the news channel on those two days which wasn't absolutely equivalent and in in this particular conflict if you don't have absolute equivalence as you know it leads to people suspecting that you're doing something deliberately to be biased that isn't the case it was it was genuinely a difficult editorial decision about which hearing they went with you think that was a mistake to do the coverage? News have did. said that they, if they, if they thought about it again, they might have done it differently. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Damien. Thank you, Chair. Um, <coughs> picking up, actually, because I want to ask about impartiality, um, picking up on that, as you'll be aware, there have been lots of complaints um, about specifically the Arabic service and specifically individual journalists mm -hmm. who are working for the BBC but also retweeting things that are essentially pro-Hamas, um, and I think you said that you know, there has been a problem there. Have you now eradicated that? Um, we've certainly taken action. Wherever we see something that's not within our guidelines, we are taking action. In, obviously, I can't talk about the individual processes we're going through. I would say it, it, the Arabic service, in terms of its output, we should be very proud of. I mean, this is a service since 1938 with 33 million um, listeners, viewers, that does an extremely good job. And one of the reasons we're trusted around the world is through services like that. And the individuals themselves, by the way, in, in total are under enormous pressure. I mean, the threats, the threats we're facing to our journalists, I mean, even, I think we should set this in a bit of context. I mean, only in the last two weeks we found out that Iranian courts have been you know, have passed sentences on journalists on our Persian service. I mean, we have to set this in context. Now, having um, said that, it, some of those tweets that we've seen are unacceptable, and we have taken action, and we will continue to take action. Now, whether I can commit to you, it will never happen again. Of course not. But, but we are robust, and I think we're doing the fair thing. We're acting fairly and judiciously, and it's not easy. I mean, you're seeing it around the world. Every news organisation, every cultural institution, as you know, is under enormous pressure, political institutions. Uh, this is enormously fraught. But the BBC, I think, is steering the course. And the answer to your question is, we don't want to see that. And when we see it, we will take action and look at the appropriate <coughs> sanction. That will not always be leaving the BBC. It might be the various ways in which you can take action. We have had people leave the BBC, but that's where we are. But you've had people leave the BBC as a result of stuff they have said during... Well, things like, things like yeah, so it's, you take the example of the person from BBC Three who is no longer working with... I, it's very difficult for me to go into individual cases, but we have had people who have 
who are no longer working at the BBC, I want to stop there if I can, because it's, you're into difficult territory with individuals. Yes? But, but for the, on this specific issue? It's, it's In terms of the uh, social media activity with regard to this issue, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on to a, a different impartiality matter, and one that, that's it's sensitive in a different way, um, but it does bear directly on your point mm. about institutions maintaining yeah. confidence. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll get into it through the Justin Webb case. Indeed. Uh, where, uh, as, as you know, the, the BBC complaint system um, is quite often quite uh, long-winded. You, you don't often get a result very quickly. Um, in, in his case, uh, when he said that uh, a, a particular trans woman was, was male, um, in the context of international chess, of all things, um, uh, the, he was he was instantly, almost instantly, um, reprimanded by the executive um, complaints unit. And I, I've seen reports that he wasn't even interviewed. He didn't get to put his side of the story to the executive complaints unit. And that has excited a lot of people to say, hang on, this is a clear sign of, of institutional bias that the BBC um, has, if you like, like many other institutions around Whitehall, been infused by the Stonewall ideology and, and doesn't treat the other side fairly. I th I'll let David speak a bit about the process because I think it's important. Um, I don't think we suffer from institutional bias in this area. Um, what I think our major challenge is is to ensure that we can have a... It is an area of controversy. Fact. It's also an area where I think we need to have the confidence for our journalists to be able to ask, talk, talk um, discuss these issues and we don't have no-go areas um, in the BBC. To do that we do demand of our journalists to keep within the editorial guidelines. The editorial guidelines are clear in this area. I mean have a read of them. They're not overly restricted. They're not one-side defence. They're actually, I mean the other thing is we have to be kind and caring in this and listen to people and be nice. Sorry that's not a, a really editorial comment but it's for goodness sake you know, I, I read an article this morning that said it, we were being deluged, or I was being deluged. I've had under a handful of emails. I mean, let's get real here. This is, this, is, this is being whipped up as well around us in a way that's deeply, deeply damaging to civilised debate about these topics. Welcome having to said our that, world. Have, having yeah. said that, there is also people who cared very deeply on either side of this debate, and we need to hear from them. Now, to do that... We're holding the centre of the ring here. And that is not much fun at times, I can tell you. You know, that's why I'm not on X. Yeah? But I, and I think our journalists are doing a very good job of it, if I may. A really good job. Now, in that instance, that was a foot fault. It was a breach. But Justin, you know, we talked, I mean, it's a very, it's quite a small thing. But it, it registered, it was just a sentence that wasn't quite right. We all do that. It's, it's, and, and I think that's what it was, no more, no less. And to act on that quickly is the right thing. David, sorry, do you want to, do you want to summarise my, my comments more technically? It would be helpful, yeah. <laughs> well, well I, first of all, I would say that, that in order to avoid being perceived as being biased in any way on this subject, we ceased to have a corporate relationship with Stonewall some time ago and a long time before many other corporations made the same decision. So, so we're very, very, very keen that we report both sides of this debate, which can become uh, quite difficult at times, in as fair a way as is possible to everyone concerned and to all viewpoints concerned. Uh, in the case of, uh, of Justin Webb, it was unfortunate that he didn't define his terms a bit more. Had he said um, biological, biological male, male uh, when he referred, or born male, he, he, then it wouldn't have been a problem. But as you know, it's a very sensitive subject for trans uh, women to be called male rather than female. That's part of the debate, and we need to steer very carefully through that difficult debate, make sure that we are uh, uh, not offending either side of it and not using terms that are clearly offensive to either side of it or seem to them to be taking sides in it. So had, she, had he talked about biological male, it would, have been, it would have been fine and there wouldn't have been an issue, but just asserting that all trans women are male is not what the BBC's style is on this. And we did produce, news produced, uh, in December of last year, a, a long note on reporting sex and gender in which all of this is made clear and all, the journalists should have, all our journalists should have been aware of it.
Now, the ECU, as you know, in these cases, uh, whether it takes a long time or a short time, um, and it's certainly not long-winded in its findings, is completely independent of the programme makers in coming to these decisions, and all it does is it looks at how this, how this uh, it has been done against our guidelines and against our practices, and that's what they did in this case. I'm, I'm just fascinated. I didn't know it's, so it's completely independent to the extent it won't hear the point of view of the accused. Yeah, it does. Well, it will, t it will, ask, no, it will, ask, it will ask the programme, and it did, ask the programme for its view of this matter, and it was given. So Justin's view was represented to the ECU through the programme, the Today programme in this case. So his view was understood and heard, and it wasn't that it was, it was not taken account of, but a different view was reached by the ECU. OK, and, and I absolutely get the sensitivities and indeed the desire to report it in as calm a way as possible. There is a full range of views on this committee um, on, on this issue. But, but one other aspect, just to clarify, um, I, th I think I'm right that uh, on the case of Scarlett Blake, who you know, committed a terrible murder of a woman and, and torturing a cat and things like that, the initial report uh, dis described her as a woman when it was reasonably relevant to the case that she's a trans woman. Is, I mean, is it right that you've apologised for that? I think we've, we've said that in our initial reporting, not in the whole of our reporting, but in our initial reporting, we should have made clearer what her status was, and we didn't in our first reporting of that. We took, actually, we, we, it was a court report, and the court report throughout used uh, uh, their own terminology, which we adopted, but we should have used our terminology in the BBC. And where those court cases occur, where you're talking about a trans woman, Who's, who's, who's committed a crime of that sort, we do know, need to make clear what her status was at the time that a crime was committed and what her status is now. We need to make those things clear, and we didn't make it clear and in our the initial The guidelines reporting. are clear on this. Yeah. The guide, the, if you read our guidelines, I mean, obviously we're going through the process of looking at the original guidelines, but so there was, you know, there were, there were, th that report could have been more, you know, frankly, better, better written. Yeah, I, I mean, it's interesting. You've set up this verify unit, which you're, you're very proud of, and, and yet something like this can slip through the net. You know, it, it, it is part of the verify unit to say, hang on, it may be that what we're getting from sources like court reports uh, needs... Sure, but that, 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 if I may, that, that, that's, that's verify is rather looking at big issues and uh, to the outside world. That is about ensuring thousands of journalists know the editorial guidelines backwards and have the confidence and, to, uh, and, and the training to ensure they get everything right. Now, you and I, I know that actually I think our, uh, you know, what we're delivering is nothing short of amazing on a, on a global basis across these many, many journalists who care very deeply. <coughs> now and again, in some of the areas we've talked about, you're going to get phraseology that's not quite right, and you need to act. You need to say we could be better here, and that's what we're doing. Simple as that. Um, what my, my as editor in chief, my my main concern, if I'm honest, is we begin to have a, a, a culture where the debates around these things solely migrate to echo chamber social media type environments. Mm. Yeah. So, so we have this is important. I mean, we need to fight for this because otherwise we're going to spend all our time talking about. You know, one out of 20,000 instances. Whereas what I'm interested in is preserving, from a societal point of view, an ability to bring together people to talk about these things. And if we don't fight for that, and we solely focus on the fringes, we're essentially feeding a particular narrative that drives you to a quite... And I'm quite animated about it at the moment, as you can hear, because I worry about it. Yeah. OK, well, I'll, I, I will step back for, for a bigger picture. Um, Sammy Shah... Uh, said when he was before us that the BBC needs to be match fit for the general election, which if you think things are sensitive now, just wait to the run up for that. Um, are you match fit for wait. it yet? I, I, I think we're very trim. We're ready to go. Um, but we will wait an announcement because, uh, you know, we, I, I mean, David can talk in detail about the editorial uh, policies and the, you know, the one thing this institution has is a lot of history of navigating the course in terms of all the demands of a, a general election. Um, but no, we're here to serve and ready to go. Who's going to present it? Well, we'll, we'll never tell you that until we know there's an election and when it's, well, when it's coming. So, so when the, we, we, we don't reveal our lineup until the fixture's in the diary. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's where we are. You, you've already referred to... Um, the differences with, with, um, of international coverage of the ICG hearing internationally and on the domestic 
news channel. Does the, the merger of those channels make the general election coverage more difficult? I can do it, yeah. I mean, uh, it, 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 you, you, as you'll have heard from Deborah Turness and others, the, the structure of that organisation is we have one organisation, but we can do UK opt-outs and UK streams. So, I, 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 frankly, I don't think there's any issue. Um, uh, we will be able to opt out. The other, the other thing, let's be, let's be honest about it, in terms of scale... Linear, linear news channels I love to bits but they are not where <coughs> it's going to be the vast vast numbers are going to be in the big BBC One broadcasts and uh, online um, that's, what, that's where it's going to be but I don't see any issue on the news channel no the, the critical thing for us wherever whatever the output is whether it's online whether it's on TV on radio whether it's in the UK or internationally the critical thing for us is that it's impartial and for that Absolutely purpose, right. as you know, right. uh, every election that's held in, in, in the UK, the BBC produces a specific set of election guidelines. There's a set on the editorial guidelines website at the moment that relates to the elections that start in the great, for the Greater London Assembly and the London Mayor today, I think. Uh, the election period starts today and next week for the rest of the elections in England and the Police and Crime Commissioner's elections. There's a, there's a set of, editorial guide, of election guidelines that apply to those. I already have, and I have in front of me here, a set of draft election guidelines for the upcoming general election, just in, in relation to your match fitness. But we can't put the finishing touch to that until Ofcom produces its paper, its guidance paper about how much coverage should be allocated to each of the parties, which it does before each election that takes place in the UK these days. And we then base the, uh, the coverage that we allocate on Ofcom's uh, recommendations in, in that paper and on their findings in relation to previous electoral <coughs> history, what I call the ambition, the number of, of seats that people are fighting, and also uh, opinion poll ratings. So, so all of those things get taken into account. We then make sure that, and this is the critical part, the most difficult part, that all of our output everywhere is, is impartial and we give the appropriate coverage to all of the parties standing in the election. Thanks, Damien. Rupa. Um, hi, everyone. Yeah, I mean, look, one barometer people have of impartiality is the panels that you see on question time. And for the last full year that figures are available, apparently there were 28 pan panellists from non-DOM or foreign-owned overseas billionaire sort of media outlets 28 of those, and only six from centrist or centre-left, and I'm counting from Private Eye to Daily Mirror, Navara and Vice Media. Doesn't that look massively unbalanced? Anyone? I'm, 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 I'm sorry to say I'm totally unaware of that data and where, it, and where it's come from. All I know is that, so I'd be very interested to see it, but all I know is that... Uh, the question time team, which is incredibly expert in this, spends a lot of time spinning a lot of plates in the air, trying to make sure that its panels are, are gender representative, are ethnically diverse, are geographically disparate, are socioeconomically representative, are politically representative of all of the different political parties and, and in the country, uh, plus uh, all kinds of other factors that weigh into their dis dis decision about who's on the panels, quite apart from whether or not the people concerned are actually good at being on panels or not. And so, so all of those factors are taken into account on a weekly basis. And over time, over time, the question time team uh, uh, aspires to get a genuinely representative <coughs> uh, range of people with all sorts of different views on their, on their panels. So I'm not aware of that piece of analysis. I'm very, very happy to, yeah, have, I mean, to have a look at it again, and see whether there's any inherent bias in what they're doing. But I, all I can say is they struggle in, incredibly hard. They have some, some advice from my chief advisor of politics about this. To, they, they struggle incredibly hard to make sure that that panel is... They, is they also look at the long-term data. Yeah. So it's worth us just looking at the data and just making sure, you know, in terms of in the round, because that's 34 people out of a lot. So we need to have a look at it in the round. No, I don't want to dismiss the data. I'm just saying, there is, to David's point, if you talk to the question time, well, I have, others have, we've been down there talking, many of you will be, have, have had the pleasure, is, is they work extremely hard on a data-based approach. So we should look at that. I mean, I'm, I mean again, I'm more yeah, to look at it. More figures from that same year, 22, 23. Six trade unionists. So these are people who represent millions and millions of working people 
but 13 business people, you know, the man from Sainsbury's, the man from Iceland, you see them pop up every week. Six trade unionists only. It, it doesn't look right. And again, you said political balance. If you think about it, the Green Party are in power in Scotland. They have one MP in this place. I'm sure we don't see them as much as the 35 appearances Nigel Farage has done. Tice comes on a lot. Do you know what I mean? It feels like they're called reform now, aren't they? That they're quite a regular fixture. Whereas parties who, they've never had anyone actually elected to parliament. It, do you know what I mean? It feels they have a lot of airtime from you guys. Well, you're talking about the numbers of appearances by Nigel Fraud over a very, very long period of time. If you totaled up all of the Green Party appearances over that same period of time, I'm sure it would come to a significant number as well. So I think you have to be really careful about comparing apples with apples and pears with pears here, making sure that you've got the right, the right sorts of com comparisons. Well, I but, but, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'm very happy to take the figures away Again, and take right them to question time and ask, and ask them whether, whether they think this is, they, they've managed to fulfil the requirements do you notice that they have. Melanie Phillips the other week, she's been on 28 times. Piers Morgan, people like that, 23 times. I mean, I know you want shock jock people for a bit of value who say something controversial, but still, you do have in your charter educate, inform, entertain, all that stuff. Oh, and yes. to be, so I, I think that would be worth taking away and looking at. Well, certainly, I, I, if you've got data which I haven't seen or which the okay, Question Time yes. team haven't seen, we'd certainly be happy to take it to the Question Time we'll team do. and Thank ask you. them to talk about and if necessary, even drop you a line and explain okay. what they're, they're, where they're coming from. Right, okay. Um, I mean, the other. Um, case that popped up this week. I mean, if you think about, they're now called Reform UK, but in their previous incarnation as UKIP, David Cameron called UKIP a bunch of far right, a bunch of fruitcakes, loons and closet racists. They're now called Reform UK. Their one MP was not elected, but lost the Conservative whip for Islamophobic conspiracy outbursts that he did and wouldn't apologise. This week, you've had to apologise for calling them far right. Um, I just wondered how much pressure you were under and from who, because it's not by Ofcom. So, yeah. yeah well, a lot of people would I, say, if you, you know, some I, of their I, candidates. I don't think far right's the right label. Full stop. And that's my, our judgment editorially. Yeah? We may have different views on it, but I don't think it's the right label. Um, uh, in terms of pressure, we did have a few complaints, but we reflect on it ourselves. I mean, that's, that's, it's, these are editorial judgments. Uh, my, my personal view is you've got to be a bit careful with far left, far right, with parties that carry quite a lot of support. And Where would you place them on the spectrum? I mean, some of the statements from some of their candidates are quite alarming. Yeah. The Guardian said they're a haven for conspiracy theorists, extremists. With, they're a with, Social Democrat Party in all but name. They're against but international law. I understand, but with, with, with respect, society, with respect, if we law. if we judged our labels by individual quotes from members, I think that would be an interesting strategy in itself. With you know, I think they're clearly right. You know, a right, a party on the right of politics. I just think if you get into far left or far right descriptors and we'll behave fairly on this, you you end up in. It, the wrong territory. But from them, they complained a lot, and then you backed down the scrubbing apology. I, I, we got complaints, but if you think we just, you know, respond under pressure on that, that's not how we work. We consider. It looks like it. Well, it may, it, uh, but I'm just telling you how it works. It, it, it absolutely, and I understand the concern. I am, and, and these are these are judgments. But my view is, um, we made we we made the right call in terms of saying that that is not the right label. I mean, I know in 2021, James Wilde MP said there were not enough Union Jacks in your annual review. In a, mm, I remember, it was my, one of yeah, my only social, one of my only time. media social, social media your hits, hit, yes. uh, where it was a, a largely a positive experience for me. Yeah. Yes. In a 268 page <laughs> annual report, he didn't like the lack of union. So I'm glad you haven't backed down in some respects, but it, you know, I think you could be it's Sorry, I'm, lo I'm lost on the comment. I, uh, I just I mean, want to understand it so look, I can respond. Okay, so in, in um, I, I don't know who's pressuring you. It just seems a bit odd that if you're, you're backing with, down. With, it's again, not with respect, I am pressured from, and I, and I love this job, but the pressure is ferocious from every side. If we responded to every, I'm, I'm, you know, we, we're getting, this is a more polarised time. I talked about this. Uh, everyone wants to ascribe intent. 
They were, you know, there are people who think we've got an agenda to the right, an agenda to the left. We're woke warriors on one side, we're cons small c conservatives on the other. I can tell you that if you go and meet the editors of programmes like this, Question Time, I'm fiercely proud of them. Because what they're trying to do is calmly get this right. This is not from an agenda. Give those figures but, because it, no, the no, we want the, term the we want the sorry. Just yeah. to, they're very helpful, so we should have those figures, and they're useful for the question time team. They'll take them in the right spirit. But I'm just I'm just saying we're trying to make judgment that uh, apply this fairly ac across the board. And by the way, I, I've had I've had incoming on every side on question time. Or Laura Coonsberg or any of those programmes. They have your three talking heads, and you've got two levers and a journalist or something. It's quite people do notice this. But okay, I'll send you some hard facts on this because it looks like you're being lent on. The whole point of the midterm I, I, review. I, I just want to be really clear: we're not see. being lent on. Okay, I'm saying how it, it's no, no, no but, but that, that's where I'm. Personal. But I'm, I'm, as, as yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, as director general, that we're not being lent on in that way. We, we are open-minded to complaint. You know, when complaints come in, reflect them and go, are we in the right place? Having smart people to do that. And as you know, we've we split. David's, uh, you know, job focus is very much on pre-broadcast. We've got Peter Johnson as public. We might come to that in terms of the, the complaint system. It's very strong. They're very wise people, and they're thinking through these issues. They are, you know, we do not make decisions ba based on strength of pe people leaning on us. We're an fiercely independent, without fear or favour broadcaster. That's what we stand for. And, and anyone who says different is, fa is factually incorrect. Now, that's not to say we're not immune from when people have views or can't kind of, you reflect on it. That's, it's not being weak to think through something if someone raises an issue. It's just sensible. Have you got any comment on these stories that after forcing out people from the news channel and splitting you're going to re uh, sorry you're going to reverse everything you did the the merger a lot of people uh, lost their jobs over it and now you're going to do an about turn and do separate channels for world and domestic again it's been in the telegraph is is there any truth in that no, we, we always said that we would balance the, the different streams and ops and we continually make changes, but the overall move to one news channel, and there are, I mean, to the earlier credit, there are risks with that uh, when you've got a big domestic story. But the, but the, the other thing is, remember, I mean, we, we, can, we may well touch on funding. We have had our budget cut by 30% in 10 years to 2020, and we've had to cope with So you can't do everything. So every, I mean, I, I, I care about these things, but we had to make some changes. And we're not rowing back, we're just, but we'll make adjustments editorially as we go. And last one from me, um, the Gary Lineker review, or whatever it was, the John Hardy review. John Hardy review, about yeah. the social media <laughs> yeah, no, it, output. There was only one person writing that review, to be clear. Yeah. <laughs> that was not the midterm review. I, I, know, I know there's been speculation on that, but yeah, it. yeah. Not the midterm review, but that specific one yeah, in that case. Yeah, the social media review um, by John Hardy is what we're doing. What, what's changed practically? I think we're doing well. I think, I mean, I, mean, I know everyone have their view on what about that tweet or what... I, I, I honestly think we're doing very well based on what I see around the world. I mean, you know, 20,000 people, yes, we have issues to deal with. And by the way, I did say to the committee um, when you asked me, would, would I continue to have issues in social media? I said, absolutely. You've got 20,000 people with different accounts and this, that and the other. You're going you're gonna to have some yeah, exceptions and things going on. But when I look monthly at our reports on thousands of journalists, how they're behaving, and also across the BBC, I think we're in pretty good shape. Are you confident it can withstand a general election? Someone won't be yeah, tempted to Yeah, I, 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 I think it can. But, but do I think I'm going to be picking up the paper and not reading about anything in the next year? Only in my dreams. I think, I think some, some, you know, this is an area where you're constantly going to have to manage it. And you've got, free, you've got freelance community, you've got others. I think where I feel very strongly is, and remember, the guidelines are tight for news, journalists, <coughs> factual programming. And I have to say... They are doing an outstanding job, and I thank all of them. Um, local journalists, I mean, you know, and they've been through a lot in terms of all the, all the things going on. I think they behave brilliantly. I think it's working very well. Thanks. Thanks, Rupa. Alex? Just, just a quick follow-up from the middle of Rupa's pack of questions. Um, <coughs> if, you were, if you described the Conservative Party as a centre-right party, the Labour Party as a centre-left party, how would you describe reform and the Workers' Party? You both have a Member of Parliament. I just stay on the right and the left of politics. That's all I need to go to. Okay. 
Hi. Um, thank you. Yeah, um, just to follow up on some of your answers, you've said, you said we're doing well several times in answer to some of the questions. Is there anything you'd like to tell us about that's not going well? Oh, how long have you, how long have you got? Well, we, we, no, but, no, but we, we've got... You're to be scrutinised. We, no, no, absolutely, we've got loads of work to do. I think, you know, what, if you look at the midterm review, it says, you know, there are still... We're still doing... You know, we, we still get to 94% of people a month. That's very good. But actually, if you look at in a hyper-competitive market... There are certain sections of society that get less value from the BBC, so we need to work harder on that, in direct answer to your question. Uh, we could talk about across the UK, where I feel that in some parts of the UK we're not delivering as much value as we could to people because we could be doing more work locally and more producing more, and we're, we're in the midst of that, so we, we can improve there. I think we now and again make journalistic mistakes. They're, 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 low, they're low in number, but you just got to constantly learn, like the ones we've been talking about earlier. So, of course, we can improve there. And so, um, yeah, I, I think there's plenty to do. And I think, I think also institutions have to be properly questioning of themselves in terms of groupthink. That's one of the reasons I like pushing, you know, major areas of news outside London. You know, you, you can, for, for the first time, you can become a network news editor without coming to, the, to London. That's major. And it, it, it's subtle, this. It shapes the output. It, you think differently. You know, if you look at the quality of breakfast, for instance, television, uh, you know, it's just got a slightly different flavour coming from Salford. I think these things can, you know, we can keep improving. We can, we can get our batting averages up in terms of, you know, our, our return on our commissions and our return investment has to be outstanding versus the Netflix and the Primes because they've got much bigger pockets. So, you know, our t commissioning teams are the best in the world in terms of return on investment, but they, c they can do better. We can grow our commercial arm. Yeah, we can talk about that. So uh, the list is long. I, I remain we'll... healthily dissatisfied in that regard. I, I, th I think somebody else might be asking questions about the growth of the commercial arm. Um, but um, since the midterm review, uh, um, mm. uh, uh, what have you done to strengthen your complaints procedures? Well, as you know, the midterm review um, made a number of recommendations in relation to the complaints process, um, <coughs> one, one of which was to uh, change our, our agreement so that, so that um, uh, the board is very specifically responsible not just for creating the framework within which we, do, we handle complaints, but also responsible for the process of, of handling them uh, on a day-to-day, on week-to-week basis. <coughs> the the, the midterm review also made some other uh, uh, recommendations in relation to governance. One of them, uh, the Director General has already referred to, which was splitting up my role so that, so that there is now a, a Director of Complaints and Reviews who's responsible for all of the post-broadcast issues that arise with programmes, and I'm responsible for things that happen before broadcast and for the advice and, and that goes into programmes before that in a, from an editorial policy direction I have other responsibilities too. They also recommended that there was greater uh, oversight by the committee of the board, which is called the Editorial Guidelines and Standards Committee of the board, of the, of the complaints process, and that the independent members of that board have a greater role in overseeing the complaints process and, 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 and being responsible for it. They made a, recommend, a number of recommendations in relation to, to Ofcom. One was that they should review all of the ECU upheld findings and make sure that, that, that they were satisfied. That was as, uh, as far as was needed. They've changed the basis on which written online material is complained about at the third stage. So there is a process at the moment which is rather peculiar, which involves Ofcom giving an opinion of any written online material that's appealed to it in relation to the BBC's editorial guidelines. In future, they will deal with those in exactly the same way as they deal with video and audio material. So they will, they will, um, that will strengthen the process uh, in dealing with, with written complaints about written online material. Uh, and uh, they've also made a number of recommendations about how we increase, and this is both for, for the BBC and for Ofcom, how we increase awareness of the BBC First system and the knowledge that complainants have of their ability to appeal to different stages of that complaints process. I mean, I, I, I suspect we're probably the only corporation in the land that actually has a video which explains to people how they can, can complain to us, uh, which the, uh, the midterm review liked. 
but uh, they want us to go beyond that in, in telling people how they can play. So we'll, we'll do some more work on, on publicising our process and making sure that people un understand that. And they also wanted us to, to improve some aspects of the way in which we respond to complaints and, and be a little bit less defensive about some of our, our responses at what's called Stage 1B. So there were a whole range of things, all of which we're doing, some of which actually we've already done and put into practice uh, during the course of the discussions with the DCMS about the midterm review. Uh, so as MPs, we, we're, I think we've all got a lot of experience of dealing with big corporations' complaint procedures, so you're not the only one, I can assure you. You don't have a look at powers mm -hmm. in NHS. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, I mean, that's all well and good about procedure. Um, are, are we assessing the actual people who are complaining and what their experience is and how they feel about that process? Well, what's happened is that uh, it, as part of Ofcom's review of the BBC's complaints process, which happened a little while ago, um, they did something called a mystery shopping exercise, and they, which basically involves them making complaints through the process. You and made seeing, a programme about it. And seeing how they're done. <laughs> yeah, we didn't make a programme about that, no. Um, but uh, but they, uh, they, 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 they did that, and they came up with, uh, with some findings, actually some of which have now been reflected in the recommendations of the midterm review. And we know that they're going to do another one of those, and they basically go through the whole process a large number of times, just seeing how well we deal with the complaints that come in that they give to us, as opposed to to members of the, the audience. So there is a way of testing the process in a sensible way that, that gives us good feedback and helps us to improve our system, and that's what Ofcom's interested in, obviously, as our regulator. And, and I, I heard the exchange earlier on with my colleague Julie, Julie Elliott about uh, the coverage of Gaza. Um, but how many complaints have you had in relation to the coverage? Uh, as of this morning, uh, we had um, just under 4,000 people complaining that our, our uh, a system was that, that, that our complaints process, or, or our coverage. output rather, our coverage, yeah. was um, uh, uh, biased against uh, Israel and over 4,000 that it was biased in favour, about 4,200. So those were, those were the complaints as of this morning, roughly those numbers. So they're not, they're, they're actually pretty similar, which I think reflects the division of opinion in the country as a whole on that, on that issue. Okay, and can I, can I just move, just ask you, you, you uh, published so, the new... So I just say, those are rolling totals from, yeah. from October the 7th onwards. I, I would also say that we judge, I think it's a fair pushback when people say, and I think this is important in terms of pressure, is the just number of complaints is, I mean, there's different sizes of communities, different views, all those things. So it's not that the BBC is sitting there going, oh, look, we've got the number, same number of complaints, therefore we're in the right place. I think, you know, we have to listen and to the earlier comments to some things we reflect on and go, OK, we could have done better there on every side of this very difficult situation and traumatic situation. So I, I, the, the complaints are useful context. I don't think they, they're any more than that. They're, they're, yes, but I mean, if we take the broad figures just relating to Gaza, then, uh, but, but if there are specific uh, uh, items that generate a great deal of concern. They may highlight that, you know, that course, something yeah. other than just the sort of balance of numbers. For instance, the coverage of the the um, the, the, the court proceedings in South Africa, um, you know, may have generated a great deal of criticism on one side. Yeah, yeah. exactly right. So exactly in a right. in a situation like that, where we get specifically large numbers of complaints about a specific issue, obviously we we, we will look at that very carefully, yeah. and uh, and so and usually those will get to our executive complaints unit and they will make a, a ruling about whether or not what we did was fair as well. Uh, 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 can I just ask you quickly about whistleblowing um, and you've, uh, you've published uh, new, new uh, procedures there. I mean, are people coming forward? Are they using that system? How would you assess the success or whether it's working or not? Lee, do you want to give that? Yeah, no, thank you. So, um, so yes, we have a very clear whistleblowing policy that we've had in place for a number of years and we've actually just refreshed it to also extend um, what it covers, including um, editorial serious um, malpractice as well. We think that's really important. So that was part of the feedback that we've, we've had. Um, it is well publicised within the BBC, but also externally. So you could Google BBC's whistleblowing policy and find out exactly what it is and, and how to access it. Um, it obviously operates within a whistleblowing framework. We continue to also provide training 
to our teams and to our leaders to help ensure people know how to access the whistleblowing and that it is, a con it is clearly a confidential environment and a way to raise a complaint. You can raise it internally inside the BBC, but you can also use entirely independent third parties to raise a whistleblowing complaint as well. Um, so that you can and you can choose to remain anonymous, as many of our whistleblowers, of course, do, or, or, or not. Um, at the moment, we have about 21 open whistleblowing cases um, that we tend to, to run around 20, 30, 40 whistleblowing cases. So we think um, it's well managed, it's well publicised, and of course, we have a whistleblowing champion in our um, senior non-independent director, um, in Sir Nicholas uh, Sorota as well, which is. Um, <coughs> plays a very significant and important role in helping us assess our whistleblowing decisions. Okay, th 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 thanks, thanks for that. And just can I say about being election ready mm. and bias. Mm. Now, um, members of your board have been uh, quite controversial in the past and accused of being um, partial, uh, politically partial. Mr. Robbie Gibb springs to mind, just given another four-year term on your, on your board. Um, is there a set of uh, a guide guidelines for members of the board over impartiality during a general election to ensure that there's no uh, that there's no interference, no attempt to... Uh, it just seems strange. If you remember, one of the accusations was that he went and berated uh, members of uh, the Newsnight team. Um, and uh, you know, during, a, during an election period, um, that, 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 that wouldn't be appropriate, would it? So uh, is there a set of guidelines there for, so that these people remain impartial? Well, our guidelines apply to output. So what we're focused on is making sure that everything that we do... Well, isn't, he trying to, isn't he trying to influence output? Uh, well, he would, what, what, first of all, he was invited to Newsnight. I think berated is well, we probably can, not can, quite... We can argue about that. that there's not an argument. It's just true that he was invited. But, but the, the, uh, the berated, I think, is a, is a choice of word which perhaps not everybody would use. He had a discussion with them about the delivery of of news like the delivery of impartiality. Um, in a, in a, there, there, there is a code of conduct which applies to all, all non-executive directors of the, of, 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 on the board. Forgive me, but is that his role? I what mean, is you, wrong? To, to, to go down there and talk, talk to them about delivery, and is, that, is that what he's on the board for? No, but there, there isn't anything in, in the way in which the board is constructed as a unitary board which says that members of the board or non-executive directors of the board can't speak to programmes if programmes wish them to speak to them. There's nothing that says that. So it's not an offence against the governance of the BBC to do that. Of course, you then, then might judge what the conversation was about and so on and so forth, but I wasn't there. But, uh, but there's, that's not, in principle, an offence against the governance of the BBC with a unitary board. Yeah, we'll go back to my original question, though. Is there some guidance for them? During a period of a general election, where it's there's a clear sensitive. there's a clear code of conduct. There is not specific guidelines for the. In answer directly to your question, we don't specifically say during an election because I think this is ongoing in terms of the pressures on board members and uh, within the BBC. I think we're, we're ferociously clear on it. There's a lot of noise around it. Uh, if you're a, if you're any of you are appointed to the board direct, a board position on the BBC, you are overseeing the executive. Uh, you um, hold us to account in delivering the editorial guidelines. The idea that you couldn't go and visit a programme is ridiculous or not have an opinion. But I think the editors, again, and Deborah Turnes running news, are very clear that we're editorial independent. We are accountable to the board in terms of delivery on the editorial guidelines. And we're the ones making the editorial decisions. And I think we're strong enough to do that. I mean, there'll be, a, there'll be loads of, as, as we know, we've had it, I think mercifully the, the BBC board is constructed in a way that is different to some of the other uh, public service broadcasters, by the way, that have far more political influence, by the way, and much more. I mean, you know, we have an, a, a chair who's, who can act independently, we've got independent. I mean, frankly, uh, we are very clear on what the roles are. Okay. I mean, the idea of people can't have views, I think, is one thing, uh, you know, but the, 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 I think it's very, very clear and you have to reinforce it. It's not just about one board director or whatever it's it's you're getting so much pressure if i put you in charge of one of our main news streams or that you have to be very clear on what you're delivering against which is the editorial guidelines who you report to editorially which is the news management into me that's how it works and we're in, we're responsible for the output so there's a lot of of there'll always be you know things things off off stage the issue the question i'd ask you is 
looking at our output, do you think we, you know, where if we've got an issue, let's raise it in terms of the output, because that's really that's really what I'm focused on, and that's what I'm responsible, and Deborah Turnes and the other people running the newsroom are responsible for. Thanks, Clive. Giles. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, yes, like <coughs> most people in this room, it would seem, um, I too once worked for the BBC. And um, <laughs> I have seen many changes over those years. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes I worry about the direction the corporation is travelling. And I'm a big fan of the BBC, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, there have been financial pressures over the years. And I, yes, I'm sir. worrying about selling off the silver, the family silver here. Yeah. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to speak uh, particularly about the BBC singers. Yes. One decision that was made about a year ago was to close the BBC Singers. Uh, and as we know, they had a, a major success just recently with Simon Rattle at the proms. And, um, yes, indeed. Th and and uh, that decision has been looked at again after, I think, representation from many people, because this, this is their centenary year. They were founded in 1924. Uh, and um, so, so what is the future and how, how is it seen that, a, that a, a very valuable asset that the BBC does possess at this moment, how is it seen that financially it can be sustained? Well, we've, we've committed now to a long-term future of singers. They're secure. That's good news. And by the way, I've talked to Sir Simon. I've spoken to the sing, singers. Uh, you know, I think the quality of the work is outstanding, um, unique, precious. There were, but we had enormous financial challenges as you know, mm -hmm. in terms of how do we make, uh, with the performing groups, in terms of how do we make uh, the numbers work. Um, the answer to your question is, is the thing is a secure, and that's great news, and it's been helped by a partnership with what you say, who are helping us with more. It's not, it's not selling the, uh, that would, we might be going to a different area and selling the family silver. I'm never going to sell the family silver, but it just allows you to just do a little bit more commercial exploitation in the way things like the concert orchestra have done. Um, you know, I can, I can so take away from this that the future of the BBC Singers is secure. You, you can definitely take away that. Um, we've got the partnership and um, yeah, that's where we are. We're in a good position. They're moving from there to the BBC Orchestras. Indeed. As, as, as another issue, another family yeah. silver, very valuable, very successful. What is the future there? Well, I'm a big uh, supporter, of, you know, as you know, I managed audio music and, uh, and cherish the orchestras. Um, we have, we Again, futures, to, you know, we believe in all the orchestras with our current funding. You can never say on these things, you know, long, long, long term, but under my tenure, the orchestras are incredibly precious, very valuable. I could go through every one and talk about what they're doing in terms of the repertoire, how they act within that creative economy. <coughs> Again, I can take um, away from this they, that the they orchestras are, are they, secure. They, importantly, what we've said is, I think there have been questions, I'm just being very direct, in terms of how many people you have, you know, how many, how many people have the staff, how many people you bring in as free, all those questions. What we've been able to do is, and orchestral tax relief has really helped us on this. I, I could bore for some length on the orchestras, but I'll stop myself. But the, the other thing we've been able to do is say there will be no compulsory redundancies in the orchestras. So that may be that we look, you know, we're always looking at exactly the right number of... Are you saying then that there's a certain shrinkage that we have to accept in BBC orchestras? No, I, I, I think there's a valid question about just how many people you have on staff versus how many people you um, bring in as performing musicians. What I'm saying is all the orchestras are secure, funding is secure, and we are in a position where we can guarantee no compulsory redundancies. And also what I don't want to be in a position is taking any of those performing groups to a point where they can't deliver the breadth of repertoire that we need. So I really I think we're in a very good place. I'll take that away as, as sort of fairly good news. Um, but I'd look, It's good news. Go, I, think, go, going, I don't think you need to caveat go, it. It's good news. Going back to the family silver and the overarching uh, direction of travel of the BBC. I mean, we'll remember the days of the BBC rehearsal room, fondly known as the Acton Hilton. Um, where we yes. had, I think yes. there were there were 18 <laughs> different studios in in which we rehearsed, and um, there was a, a canteen at the top, and there was amazing <coughs> cross fertilisation of talent in that building. I remember it personally. Indeed. Uh, and um, the decision was made. I think it, it it sort of closed down, then came back in 2007, and now <coughs> it's gone, and it's going to be. It's now going to be flats. We we know what's happening to the Acton Hilton and that whole thing. Have we thrown away something really valuable there? Because I, I can see... Are you a, talking about Acton? Uh, I'm talking about the Acton-Hilton <coughs> decision are you talking about and the direction of travel of the BBC because the, there, there are issues now about selling off Elstree, um, uh, selling off uh, uh, the EastEnders set, 
etc. It seems to be a general trend of travel that's been going on for sort of 30 years now. Oh. Um, and, and it feels to me that the BBC might be losing some of its essence. Because okay, the, the, the Acton Hilton, I just made a, a short list, there were, there were shows like Dad's Army, Forty Towers, ab- absolutely fabulous. And, and all those people were working in the same building Absolutely. With the same cross fertilization of talent. And I personally moved from one program to another because I was there and I was there with the writers and the directors okay. and they were all in the same place. And I understand absolutely that the economies of, of uh, uh, people rehearsing in, in village halls all over the place and, and okay. farming out a lot of that. But we've lost something really valuable that the BBC uniquely had. And, and I'm frightened that we're going further down that line. Do you have anything to say to that? Uh, I, I think I can reassure you. I mean, no one, no one cares about that more than when you walk around some of the old studios and feel the, the magic of what the BBC is. Now, and I, I know I'm in danger here because I think we can look back at the, and I'm quite obsessed by the golden past of the BBC. But if, Mama you, Ducassi, if you Exactly right. But if you go to Broadcasting ha- House now, you, it's a fizzing buzz of, you've got the radio theatre there, you've got the Radio 2 now there, Radio 1. I mean, it's great. And, and there's loads of creative energy coming through that, that building. I thought you were going somewhere differently, because we can talk about Elstree, which is largely, I think there's a technical thing about who owns the site, but, and pro- we're going to protect these senders, and I think we're fine on that. The, 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 the key is pr- protecting the creative <coughs> output there. I, think, I thought you, you were going to, you, if you, I you, may, I'm going to draw I thought you were going to, going to mention Made Avail, because of all the list of things I worry about that, those factors you're talking about, just being very open with you, it's the special source that is Made Avail 3 and what it is, I was in there the other day for Radio Absolutely. 2 Piano Rooms. Now, we have made a decision because the cost of redeveloping Made Avail was off the scale. So, therefore, taking and developing the East London site with London Docklands, I think is very exciting. It's going to be one of those buildings you're talking about where you'll have to your earlier point, orchestras, singers, other things going on. So I Tim, think we can brilliantly, that. brilliantly steered me away from the visual arts of the BBC to the radio side of things. I'm still talking about the... the, the we the, haven't got... Where, where's the threat on the visual arts? Sorry, I'm, 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 I mean, I, in fact, I'm seeing production bases. I mean, the idea... The, I would say one thing, which is the market has moved radically in terms of owned and operated studio businesses. Mm-hmm. That is, you know, I don't want to spend money if I'm blunt on property when I can spend it on content. So there's that tension there, but if you look at what we've got in Pacific Key, you look in other areas, we're still doing our work and developing that. I don't, see, I, I don't see this. I think, I think um, we can be incredibly proud of what we've done. Look at Roth Lock in Wales. Yeah. Look at Roth Lock. But look, at, look at Doctors, which is being axed. For but, but, but again, if, uh, that's a very interesting story in Western Midlands. So what we see, and, uh, and Doctors have done a fantastic job, but that in terms of prioritising our money, in terms of titles that work and give most audience and also most delivery against our corporate purposes. And now, when I look at the plan for West Midlands, I'm incredibly excited. If you go and visit, and I really recommend the committee go to Digbeth, it's amazing. <coughs> we, are, we, are, we have got, um, you know, Stephen Knight there developing the studios. We're taking MasterChef four strands with Endemol Shine up there, 130 jobs. We've committed absolutely with the regional mayor and the local council, uh, city council, we've done an enormous amount of work. So, so, you're so career but, but, and the, talent but, pathways but, are still available. I, I, think, I think it is a challenge. The, the biggest worry I have with doctors is that, by the way, is, is doctors has, without a doubt, provided enormous routes for lots of writers, lot, and soaps do that. We've got a problem yes. in the market, by the way, which is soaps are not getting the audience they once were. That's just a fact. So, so you've got where I think it's really important is to have it for these the jobs and career pathways is a couple of things I've mentioned. One is to have ongoing strands, not just two parts floating in and out. And that's what Stephen Knight is doing in terms of building the studio. And also, MasterChef has four strands, so it's permanent work. It's not just float people in for twelve weeks. So the answer to your question is, I am concerned about it. I could spend an enormous amount of time talking about the work we've done in terms of creative industry clusters and how we're trying to develop those career pathways. And by the way, if, you t- if I got the question earlier about improvement, one thing we can improve, and we may well touch on, is making sure the industry remains. And we've done a lot of work, and I'm proud of it, but making sure the industry is truly open to all 
and making sure that those pipelines are in place is a real challenge. I worry, though, that the BBC, which was the gold standard for co- career pathways in, in, in broadcasting, uh, it is losing its centre. And, and, and Sorry, one, of those, one of those points mm. is, is the removal of the director's course many years ago, because I know many, one particular, Peter Howard, came through the BBC director's course and went on to become a major Hollywood director. Um, the BBC used to do, do these things, and I worry about general shrinking, not over the past five years, not over the past 10 years, but over the past 30 years. If you look, if you look at what we've done, like, that is a very valid worry. But if I may, I think, it, you know, if you look at our record, um, we're, on, we're pushing on apprentices. Yeah, we, we, I'm the one that says we need to bring apprentices into BBC. We've got over 800. It's amazing, by the way. We're developing those careers. So, so this is really important. What I would say, and I'll get back to funding, if you take 30% out and you take, take the money out over the last few years, you cannot grow the organisation. In fact, we've had to reduce painfully the amount of people in public service BBC. What I hope we can do is keep a couple of things. One is the special source you were talking about creatively in terms of those spaces, critical. And the second is the career pathways. But, you know, the apprentices is... is we've done a huge amount of work in this area. I mean, Lee can talk about it as well. It's, it's very important to us. I don't, I don't think we're, we're, we're losing that. And, by the way, our role as the catalyst for creative industries growth and developing those careers, such as forming apprentice hubs, you know, in areas like the West Midlands is as critical as it's ever been. In fact, it's more, I think we're, we're more valuable than we've ever been. Anyway. Uh, even, even taking, this, <coughs> Chair, be, this is my last question, but even taking the, the cuts that we've seen uh, and, and perhaps looking at potential new models of funding for the BBC in order to maintain its gold standard, under your watch you feel that, that the BBC is not shrinking, it is, it is growing? Absolutely, I think we. I think we. We. we, we on in the, that's a big question in terms of where you where you take the sure. where you take the answer in terms of overall revenues in terms of what we're doing in the corporate. It can't, you know, we, there's big questions for the next charter. What I do think is under 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 this period, we are absolutely prioritising careers and making sure that the creative spaces we've got are protected. That is essential. Thank it's our it's our you. special source. You're at it. I agree with you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Giles. Simon. Morning, um, thanks for coming in. I want to talk about BBC Local Radio. Surprise, surprise. Um, BBC Radio Devon, Cornwall, Cambridgeshire, Solent, Tees and London lost between 19,000 and 50,000 listeners in the most recent audience research known as Rajar. Some did make some marginal yeah, gains mixed. across the network. But overall, this looks like managed decline, is it? I hope not. I hope not. And I think that, you know... The, the truth is, as you know, is re- if you step above even the discuss- discuss- discussions we've had in terms of local radio um, within the BBC, there is massive pressure on linear radio listening and there's massive pressure on local linear services. There's no doubt about that. So if you actually look, the long-term declines are worrying. So we have to work all we can. And if you talk to the editors of those stations, and you know, I've been out and about in a number of locations recently, is I think they're all utterly committed to make sure that their local radio services are you know, doing all they can to mitigate radio. <coughs> what I would say is, and you know where I'm going, which is alongside that, I think we were right to reprioritise some of the money within an overall flat budget, as you know, to drive digital local provision and I think that is being important so while we've seen pressure on local radio and we've got to see how the changes flow out by the way and learn from that and it was a bit of that radio was a bit early so so and and the teams are doing amazing work under enormous pressure but what we are seeing in online news by the way locally is rapid growth so you know I am very proud that now if you go on my phone on the main news app I get my local news that's a major breakthrough if you're, if you're a local journalist. It's great news. And we're up over 20% on the quarter in terms of online local news. We're also recruiting 130 journalists, as you know, into local yeah. and forming the investigative network with 70 of them, which I think gives us a real chance to get in and grow local. So I still remain absolutely wanting to deliver on aggressive and punchy local targets I think what we can do in local well, radio. What are your aggressive, punchy targets for BBC Local Radio? Because that, that scale of decline, and we know that local radio in the last 10 yeah. years has declined considerably before yeah. you made these changes too. 
But how much, how sustainable is this? Like, well, if, you, the, the if, main, the if main... you continue to see losses like that, mm. how how long is it until you just switch the transmitters off? No, I, don't, I don't. I think we're way away from that. By the way, um, the that the the target the target is beyond local. It's not just local radio. So it's, let me tell you, if you were now, if I put you in charge of a region of the BBC and you know it well, um, your target from me is and through the team is. Can you ensure that 50% of the population are getting local content regularly from the BBC and getting their news? That's the big battle, by the way. Mm. Within that, you, you know, again, we know local radio reaches, on average, around 15% of the population. So it's precious to them. And I, want, I, I would like us to hold those numbers as part, but while growing and making sure we sustain 50% reach. How is morale amongst... BBC local radio. I think I've been out. What, I, we, what we saw because of the process yeah. he went through were some tearful goodbyes. Yeah, and indeed. Very upset audiences who were majorly disrupted because yeah. the schedule yeah. of various different radio stations is completely different to what it was before, with some very well known local names up and down the country suddenly losing <coughs> their jobs. Yeah. But by some recruitment process that no one quite understood. Um, because it wasn't particularly clear and appeared to be different in different regions as to the questions that were asked and the way that people were appointed. What is morale like? You, you've done a tour of different, oh, yeah, different, yeah, different, sorry, different sorry, a, tour, a tour sounds rather grand. In, in my day-to-day, yes. you know, I'm, I'm out in the regions quite a lot. I, so, I realise. So recently I've so been... So you've been I've, speaking I've been, to staff. I've been speaking directly to staff at the desk talking. I mean, but by the way, these are just snapshots. So you've got, I mean, and obviously we've, we have... Um, we have look. I think I think morale is mixed. I mean, it's been really is mixed. Mixed is not a little no, bit of no, a no, It may be. I'm I'm, I'm trying to stray not uh, lurch to management euphemism. Yeah, I think the the what I'm trying to s- say is I think the teams have been through an enormous amount. That change is incredibly painful. Actually, 75% of the presenters who applied did get jobs, and actually, the number the BBC is a caring employer. It tries to minimise compulsory redundancy. If I may say. Versus that is a there's a balance here, isn't there, between managing those types of processes, versus what in my old world a, a, maybe a commercial company would do via an email. If I'm being blunt, yeah. And I prefer a caring way in which we manage our transition and change, but that is very stressful for people as they go through it. I totally recognise that it's been very difficult, and I think it's put us under enormous pressure. And it's also there's people who eat, care desperately about their output and they are doing a good job. It's never been a criticism of them and doing a good job. What lessons have you learned from that process then? Because, I, you know, looking at it from a, even a listener's point of view, the elongated process that it, 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 that it involved, the tearful goodbyes, all those sorts of things, yeah. and a, an awful lot of upset, what, what would you do differently this time? If I, think you, you to, I, th- I think I would reflect on how long... The process, I think, has been well managed, but it's just how long you need to calmly get through those processes and how long that takes... I, I, I do think, however, as a media organisation, and everyone has gone through it, we are going to go through change. And, and I say that because I think if we had not... This is about moving 10% of the, fun, 10% of the funding mm-hmm. to digital, and it's the right thing to do. And the other thing I see on the ground is I do now see... And, uh, you know, these are glimmers, and I, I know there'll be people going, well, do, you know, don't you understand how... We do. It's, been, it's really been very tough. But the reason I use mix, and I genuinely believe that to be right is on the ground you are also seeing journalists who, by virtue of connecting up, so, you know, the multimedia offer and allowing stories, investigative reporting to go into online, not just be sitting on radio, doing is really opening up the amount of reach we can get for our stories. And you, you know that the vast, vast majority of people, and this isn't about young people, it's nothing to do with the lurch to youth, it's to do with, you know, if we look at 60-year-olds, most of their news is consumed online Mm -hmm. we have to be there and and i think that is the balance i do see people beginning to when they see 22 percent increase in you know online stories that's in a quarter and i and i do think also digital offers it but that's cold comfort to people of an older generation who loved and listened to their bbc local radio station as a friend Mm. and now hear a voice from miles away with, with with a disconnect to their local community that's, yeah. that's the difference. I understand the move to online. I have seen in my region a huge growth in online local stories, which is welcome. But 
What I've also witnessed is programmes that sound distant, because they are distant, and they don't have that same connection with that audience. That audience that has, because of changes to other networks that you run, including national services, very few places to go. I, that audience is utterly precious, and what we've tried to do is keep, as you know, 39 breakfast shows, keep where the vast majority of the listening and the reach is. Yes, the 20 shows in the afternoon is a compromise, but if you've got a fixed budget, you're going to have to make choices. Get that. And, 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 and I think actually we've been quite nuanced. It's been very tough, but we've, we absolutely have tried to protect good service. I've talked to some of the presenters who are doing the shared shows. They, yeah, there, there is compromise there. But they're brilliant people. They can make connections with listeners. We've got very good people doing it. And I think, actually, um, <coughs> we're in a pretty good shape in terms of some of the offers that I'm seeing now. It has, it, it has been painful. It has been a question of compromise. And, but the idea, you know, would I like a, a budget that just can grow and do all these things? I would. Um, the, the other thing I'd say, by the way, is digital products, we, we probably don't talk enough about it in some of these, but the rewiring of the BBC is huge in turn and it massively helps local what do i mean by that it, putting local stations on sounds putting content on sounds to all those things now there's then a bigger conversation which says look we know that many often older people this is their lifeline this is their <laughs> companionship this is their connection but we also have to open up the digital world to as many people as possible and that is what we should yeah. be doing what, what have you done to review the impact of those changes you've made on audiences. So well, we're, we're the waiting for the, we, we, we monitor the number, I'll talk about you know, the 50% yeah. things. I think we need a bit more time, if I'm honest. I, I think we just need to see them flow out for the next year and see where we end up. What about skills for the future? Because mm. one of my main concerns is, yeah, of course, you'll have journalists come through that can write a story for online. That's a very difficult, a very different, rather, um, set of skills to writing and putting together a radio package or a radio news bulletin. How are you going to make sure you still have that talent pipeline? Well, I, th I think what we need to do is train people across media and those precious... Remember, we've still got many people working in local radio across 39 sites. Yeah. And with apprenticeships as well, I think we need to continue that. And those craft skills are so important. Yeah. And that, you know, the other thing is they're, they're under pressure in the wider market, as you know. So often we're the only show in town in terms of proper That's the training problem. on production. No, we feel the responsibility. And, and my vision would be that multimedia training is really important. Is what, what I would say is also, if I may, which is if you're just a radio producer, and I say just because they're brilliant and mm -hmm. that is an amazing skill, um, but actually building your, if you're building your career, working and able to work on the online environment as well, I think is a real asset yeah, as well. I mean, so I, so I, I think for, for, I meet many people. Now, I think how we deliver that training and making sure it's flawlessly delivered and supported, supporting people is the right question. Um, and yeah, that's that's what we need to keep working on. Right. I've got uh, one or two other questions, just slightly different from local radio, if I may. When you announced all these changes to services because of the squeeze and the license fee, you uh, announced, I think, that Radio Four Extra was going off linear DAB. Is that still the case? Um, maybe long term, but not not in the foreseeable. Not, the not in the short term, no. That's good news for me personally. Um, when it comes to local television news, we've seen investment in some local regions, but I think BBC South had a refit recently. The, these these programmes, um, even more so than BBC Local Radio, controversially yeah. in my own view, um, have a very strong audience, Huge continue audience. to shine. My local is BBC Spotlight, which I think is the most watched yep. regional news programme, rightly so, in the country. Um, so how do you protect it like from, from anything in the future that you can see at the moment? Are you, when you're horizon scanning... Well, one, one of the things I don't do is, because what we get is we get everyone wanting commitments on full protection on everything forever. I, I, I'm not going to do that. What I would say is, one of the questions I regularly ask people is, what is the most successful tele, tele, television programme in the UK? Day in, day out. Now, when, we, when, when Traitors does its business, we can beat it. When Strictly has a good night... But day in day out, it's the regional 6.30 news. It is absolutely critical. And one of the balances we've got to have is between, obviously, I want to ensure we've got the right teams and the right people in place, but also we have invested in things like studios so that it looks, you know, fresh, can present the stories. So we're trying to make more efficiencies in terms of technology can help us. And one of the things I'm really excited by is actually technology allows sometimes that disjoint between network, le network level television and local television in terms of quality of the set or how it looks, 
that they're, they're, historically there's been a dividing line, we can, we can eradicate that. Now, to your question, we think they're utterly precious and the teams you know, okay. are doing a good job and I'll stay there. It's, I, I think I'll leave it there. The journalism is... I mean, it's more than just the half an hour programs as well. It's the quality of the lo- local and national. In terms and, of, and I'd include the nation. We, uh, yes, I suspect we nations might, and regions. We may get course. to nations at some point, but 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 I absolutely would include the nations in that. Are you still? You know, you mentioned about local radio um, staff having to diversify. Um, I remember when I was in the BBC, something called Delivering Quality First, which was a cuts program. I remember it. Um, it was it was extremely painful and. In that, nothing really changed. Uh, there was also a spark process as well, which meant that te- television people did radio and radio did television and all that kind of stuff. That also didn't work. Are you also making sure that regional, and people are going to hate me for this, but that regional TV staff in particular are multimedia, so do provide radio content as well? Yeah, one, one of the things I think is important is certainly from a journalistic point of view. That I, look, I, I think it's a balance, if I may, because I think there's people who are... Whenever you go, and you'll, you'll all have been to your local BBC office, you meet people who are just outstanding. No one in the world can do what they do. They're engine- they may be brilliant engineers focused on television delivery, and they know more. And by the way, they save the licence fee payer money day in, day out. So in some ways, I don't need everyone to be multimedia. Yeah? We will have some specialists, not everyone. Yeah. But when you take journalists, when you take people coming through the system, you take young producers... I absolutely think you need to, we, we need to help them with the skills to go across media. I think that's going to be essential going forward. The other thing is, I, I think a good story should not be stuck in one media outlet. So, so, so you see, if you've got a great scoop or you've got a really interesting story, why on earth did you... I mean, we've had this kind of... You know, I'll, I'll go on the 6.30 but it's not online or, it, you know, how do you pick stuff up from a breakfast radio programme and make sure it's online within minutes? These are the kind of things editorially I'm interested in because it massively, it massively increases local engagement and reach. One final question because I'll hand back to the chair. I'm conscious of time. Um, local democracy reporting and the services yes, you provide, yes. obviously top slicing from a licence fee. The salaries for those journalists are proving difficult to recruit um, you know, talented people up and down the country because the salaries are low, right? Um, is there any move or thought to allowing more money into that scheme so that you can actually provide uh, better... So we've got the 165, I'm aware of the yeah, But the, sal- the salary threshold is very, is lower. Very low. Is lower. Um, I haven't got any current plans in front of me. Can I just take that away and reflect on it? That'd be great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I do have a problem with this. It feels to me like um, you've taken a torch to what is a very delicate ecosystem of local news and current affairs. Um, Bear with me as I kind of mm. set out my thinking on this. Okay, so what you've done is taken away very valuable local radio coverage from some of our most vulnerable constituents, people who, people who treasure it, people for whom um, it's a, a lifeline, it's a friend, uh, it's a, 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 a huge asset to their lives. And, mm. you know, and, and in doing so, you know, according to the RAJAR figures, your um, local radio listening is down 14% year on year. At the same time, you... you, you <coughs> You very proudly um, talk about your uh, expansion into local online news. But by doing that, by rolling out your 34 websites and 130 more jobs to deliver more regional news, you're, you're, you're delivering it in areas that are already covered by a lot of local commercial independent publishers, like you know, in my area, the Portsmouth News, which have a, 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 a website, um, who are already struggling because of the decline of local print, uh, because of the decline of local print. Um, of print media, well, print media across the board. Um, so, at a stroke, you're effectively blowing up the services, the local radio services that some people absolutely treasure. You're undermining the financial, the financial um, the viability of some of our local independent um, publishers. Um, and now, uh, in the press yesterday, it talks about the BBC is proposing to carry advertising on some of its radio. Uh, services so uh, effectively now coming out in competition with some of our <coughs> local radio provision. Um, Tim, talk to me about this because it just yeah. seems to me like you know what you've done is you've started picking away at a very delicate ecosystem, and your role as a public service broadcaster is at one stroke seemingly trying to undermine every other aspect of the local um, news and public affairs, which uh, uh, current affairs, which we all value so dearly. Indeed, and I think they're all very fair considerations. Um, 
I think any changes are very sensitive. This is very precious, and, and we don't underestimate that. I would margin push back on blowing up. You know, we're keeping all of our 39 services. If you look at the, I think the numbers are a bit before the change, but we'll see how this goes. I think, you know, it has been a big decision to keep all 39 stations, keep, uh, you know, output local from six till two, where by far the majority of the listening is. And then, you know, we're not, the afternoons are still good radio shows and we're doing 20 of them across the land in a way. Now, I know, I don't, I'm, I'm not underestimating the enormity of this, but the idea we're blowing up the ecosystem or my vision has been to collapse local radio is just not true. The vast majority of our money, you know, in these goes in, in, our, in, our, in our local offices goes to and will remain, it stays in linear services, broadcast television, and, but the idea that we, and then we get to the second point. So, look, I think we've got to watch how we go. It's incredibly sensitive, and if, it, if people read it and understandably get concerned, well, this is just the thin end of the wedge, I understand that, yeah? And I just think we have to see how we go, but, 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 but also, you know, local sports, I could go on and on about this. We don't underestimate the value of local sports coverage and all of that things, those things that are critical. We're not blowing that up. That's the first thing I'd say. But I'm not being naive. I, th I think there, are, there, there is pain here, and it's very difficult. Mm. The second thing is, I think, um, again, an area of concern, because personally, I have always, and we'll probably talk, you know, we, I don't know whether we're going to talk DAB or whatever, but I am absolutely someone, and I think people know this, where the BBC's aim is not just to win share, it's to offer value for the licence fee. And actually, I think we should be a catalyst for market growth, not, you know, restricting the growth of others. Yeah, I feel that very strongly, by the way. So with that in mind, there's two things. Which one is, I think it would be wrong to say to the BBC, well, you just sit on a declining linear radio market in your news, because there, there is no future that says, I love these services, but there is no forecast that says linear is going to grow rapidly or, or enable you to reach enough people to justify a universal broadcasting service without getting into online. So you've got to be there. The question is, in my view, is how are you there? And are you acting judiciously? Are you adding to the market? Now, obviously, we talk to the NMA. We talk to all. There's, there's legitimate concerns about the BBC. What I would say is, you know, we come in a spirit of partnership. So linkage, making sure we're linked out to other people. I think we should be talking about partnership with the local press, how we do that. I think, and you've heard me say that before, I think some of these things are structural. So if you look at the decline of local print, and I say this with heavy heart, uh, in other markets where the BBC isn't present, look at the trend lines there, look at them where the BBC is. It's very similar, yeah? So, so I think this is not the BBC causing this issue. And actually, if you look at the amount of journalism we're producing, it's often very, very different or in a different level of coverage to others out in the market. So, but, I, but I would say we need to be driven by the data and we should be concerned about it. Lastly, on the, there's, no, there's no proposal to put um, advertising on podcasts on BBC services. So the BBC services remain there. This is about when podcasts go onto third-party platforms where they normally have it. And we have this on, whether on UK TV or whether you get BBC service on YouTube. Now, what I would say is that is being assessed at the moment. We're in preliminary stages. And clearly, we don't want to be in a position where it negatively impacts the market in any anywhere at all so look we, you know that's where we are but if you are putting your podcast on a third party service not on a bbc service we don't i mean that's not where we want to go mm. i mean you're right that you know the, the local press has got you know dwindling readership we all know that but i mean i just don't see how the role of a public service broadcaster to uh, come out in virtually in competition with their digital offer of local uh, online news is going to make that better. What would your message be to some of our um, our editors up and down the country who are just struggling with their readership, been working well, really we should hard be, to we, we should be an dis online offer? We should be actively discussing with NM the NMA, which we, 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 we want to do and continue to want to do in terms of how we can grow the market together. Yeah. I mean, I, I think this is often portrayed as a zero-sum game. My personal view is we've got a much bigger issue at play, which is the biggest threat is people disengaging from local news or going to hyper-local little networks. So actually those stories of towns holding, uh, that's why we did, the, I mean, the local democracy reporters were essentially about market failure, regardless of the BBC, and they were around a gap that just wasn't being filled by anyone. So, so if you look at the market in the round, we've got a communal problem, which is how many people are going to council meetings, how many people are holding local leaders to account. Now I don't see, with thinning economics on either side of the fence, 
how we can't be talking a bit more about partnership. Mm -hmm. So that's what we've got to do. But it is difficult. And look, traditional business models are under so much strain, and I'm very sympathetic to it. It's very difficult. And then when it comes to this um, uh, story that was covered, um, carried in the Times on Monday about the um, advertising uh, on podcasts and on-demand radio shows, I mean, so this is advertising um, on public services? No, this is advertising on purely commercial Lots offers that are carried out by BBC Studios. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, it's not, it's not news and current affairs. It's where you do... I mean, it's similar to... You know, in UK TV, we advertise BBC content, has got advertising around, but not on the BBC service. So it's a question of, if the market is all there, do you want to be there? And that's, we need to consider it, but that's where we are. But this is content, um, this is content which has been put out onto other, on other BBC services. So how can identical offers be treated differently depending on the platforms that they go out on? How does that work? I mean, what, help me understand the question a little bit more. So it, it, we, we, we were just... the. It would be clearly signposted that it, this is from the BBC, but, you know, around it... As it's a platform that has advertising, it would be, you know, as per their normal. It, 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 it's a bit like the UK TV operations. This is yeah, already. Like so, well, you, you know, you're seeing a BBC comedy, uh, um, but it's clearly, and it's got a BBC production credit, but it's clearly in, in a commercial environment. And um, what's, what's the Ofcom view on this? Have you had any conversations with them about it? I, we, we've. I, I think we t we mentioned it in our latest update with Ofcom, and they will need you know they can look at it. Obviously, I think that's right, isn't it, Lee? Yeah, I mean, I think the proposals are at a very early stage, and we'd absolutely expect that Ofcom would look at it under their operating framework, okay. um, if it's necessary and material to do so. But there's no <clears throat> there's no sort of substance to the worries of the commercial sector in that you know the concern that BBC could, BBC could suddenly flood the market, drive down advertising prices. Um, uh, you know, in a, in a market. I think that, that, look, again, they're legitimate concerns, but I think they're unfounded in terms of when we look at the data, in terms of, I think this will be very marginal, and if anything could help, the, you know, hopefully grow the market, the advertising market, into quality speech audio. But let's, you know, as I say, we're in early stages, Ofcom needs to take a look at it, and we go from there. Thanks. Um, you said we may talk about DAB. We are going to talk about DAB. You talked about compromise, you talked about choices, so here's a choice. On the 7th of February, you announced plans for a new distinctive, your words, DAB music stations, extensions for Radio 1, Radio 2, Radio 3. You said that it will be available on sounds and it will, quote, look to delve deeper into specific genres and periods of music with context, curation and storytelling done in a way only only the BBC can do and the consultation on that closes in a week's time um, not unsurprisingly it has caused some interest uh, Radio Centre said these proposals are an attempt to directly imitate the recent success of commercial stations that already provide these stations following years of significant investment made by our sector Boom Radio uh, very critical, asking listeners to write to us, to MPs, to complain to you and to complete your, to respond to the, to the consultation, saying that the new Radio 2 extension sounds remarkably like its own service. So if I may look at this with you, um, how do you respond then to criticism that you're creating new stations that encroach on what commercial radio are already doing? And when you're talking about compromise and choices, which Simon Jupp and the chair have just liaised with you on, taking away those services, why are you creating something new while taking away something that works? Um, I'll, only, I'll, I'll kind of get work my way through in terms of from the top, which is how we allocate our money, which is where can we get most value for the licence fee to, to give that value to households and get maximum return from... And this is critical, not just delivering reach, but also doing things that only the BBC can do. All right? So that's what guides our decision-making. No more, no less. Now, when it comes to the radio market, and I've been, <laughs> been around this block a while, yeah, I know. and I think what's incredibly exciting about the radio market is what's been happening on DAB, yeah? which is actually the fact we've massively expanded the choice of radio stations on linear has been a fabulous success. And, and the reason I'm going there is because because I think it's, it's changed, consumer behaviour has changed so radically. So, so, so it's radical changes in the market. We've got vast amounts of stations now. We've got vast amounts of streams. Then on the side of that, we've got Spotify. 
I'm actually very proud that the BBC invested millions of pounds in some ways as an intervention to grow DAB. And in that context, commercial radio has gained good share and, I, and I was, we've done a good job of maintaining our reach to a degree. But there comes a point where you go, OK, how do I ensure that BBC Radio, it's not about growing share, but maintains its relevance to the number of people coming to each week so that we can justify universal okay. intervention. So, what, so, what's so, gonna... so, so what I'm saying is, when I looked at the analysis, which is very clear, is two things. One is, if you look at what's the right portfolio of radio streams and stations, it absolutely makes sense, whereas we've seen rapid expansion around us to have a slightly more extended portfolio. Two, the costs are pretty small and three and critically could I guarantee that they were utterly unique in terms of their playlists and what we do and that's again final thing is Ofcom will do a competitive market so so Ofcom can look at this we've, we've shown our proposals and they can really get tucked in on it what's it going to cost because it's going to cost something right and uh, you're cutting services elsewhere just have a long discussion about it what's it going to cost well we've got to wait and see what we do because until it's approved but, but you, you wouldn't have gone to consultation you're talking you very know. low you're talking you know two or three million in terms of investment right. <coughs> a lot of money let's just look at it then briefly through the lens of ken bruce who um you know you talk, we had a football analogy discussion earlier, didn't we? And I enjoyed your taking it on. So let, let's continue with that analogy. You, you want your best players on the pitch, don't you? Or you said yeah. you want your best players at the club. You know, when Spurs sold Harry Kane, at least we got 100 million quid for him. With, yeah. Ken, with Ken Bruce, you let him go on a free and you let him take all his listeners with him. So since his move a year ago, more than a million listeners have followed him to Greatest Hits Radio with, with Popmaster, which you had an option on years ago, didn't take. Um, the station's seen its overall audience greatest hits this is increased by 70% Ken Bruce had 8.2 million listeners on the biggest radio show in the country Vernon Kay now has just under 7 million listeners Ken Bruce wanted to obviously speak and he did in a big, in, big interview in one of the Saturday newspapers um, earlier this month he said that you know you've subsequently said you were going to offer him a new contract but three months before the end of his contract nothing was coming so it seemed, and he also mentioned, you know, how how odd it is that he had suggested years ago um, that you could cater to the younger end of the radio to audience by doing something different and protect the golden goose that was what what he was doing and Steve Wright was doing. You got rid of them both, and um, you know, you, you, one of your best players has gone to to one of your opponents who's killing you, and yet now. You're reinventing with these new no, DAB no, streams. There's, there's always been reinvention, by the way. This is always, by the way, I think Ken Bruce is an outstanding talent. Why let him go then? He's, he's, well, I think there's, there's I'm not going to go into individual decisions in terms of, or, or discussions with an individual. I'm just not. But, um, and I think, um, I, all I'll say is an outstanding broadcaster. And he, uh, and Greatest Hits are lucky to have him. That's all I, I mean, I, I think on Radio 2, we've got a first class. Um, broadcaster in Vernon and seven million is a very good, but but look, I've yeah, there's one point three million less than the guy. But, that you but, let but go my there. my measure my measures to be fair are all about are we delivering what's our overall reach for BBC Radio and are we distinctive, and also are we are we delivering the right value? You're not going to keep everyone. Everyone's going to have different decisions, and at the end of contracts, they're going to make different decisions, and you're going to have different discussions. So without getting into all the detail of it, I uh, I I. I I've got the highest regard for Ken. He's a wonderful broadcaster, and, and I really mean that. I've, I've, and 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 Greatest Hits have done a great job. Presumably, as the manager or the chief executive of the of the club, you regret that he's no longer in the stable. Uh, as a Palace fan, as, I could list a lot of players that I'd rather have kept on the pitch. Mm. Well, as a Spurs fan, let's not get into Palace. Um, and then just finally, because you, you, you mentioned with Clive Efford earlier about the um, the social media guidelines about Gary Lineker, and, and you mm. said, you know, am I going to pick up a newspaper at some point in the six, in the next six months and not see a furore about something? I'll give you a, I'll give you one for free here. Here's a, here's here's a here's a yeah, suggestion. Thank you for that. There is, of course, a, a way that you can ensure that you don't pick up a newspaper and see things that Gary Lineker has said over the next six months, including during the general election campaign, which is that if he just tweets about something, you pay him one point three five million pounds of our constituents' money, otherwise known as the licence fee for, which is football. If he just sticks to football, game over. I understand. To but conclude but the we've, we, we've considered what an uh, appropriate set... Re, I don't know whether you read the John Hardy review. It's a, it's a well-considered piece, well piece of work. And I think we've, 
we can go around the roundabout on that one, but we've, we've made clear that we think for our flagship presenters we're in a reasonable position. Mm. But if he just tweets about football, there wouldn't be a problem, would there? I think we've been clear about our social media guidelines, which is, which is um, uh, absolutely protecting the BBC's position, um, and that's what we'll, that's what. We'll, and that's I know what you've we'll gone head-to-head head with him before, and it, and it didn't end well, but I'm just saying, if he tweets about what you pay him a lot of money for, you won't have a problem. And I'm guessing morale in HQ is not great when there's a Gary Lineker story on the front page of the papers, because if that happens during a general election campaign, there are going to be lots of people with a lot less generous view to the BBC than us who are going to really use it to attack you, aren't they? It's very important that people stick with the social media guidelines and they're applied. I agree with you. Partic- particularly going into an election, I agree. Let's hope they do. Chair? Thank you, Steve. Julie? Thank you, Chair. Um, equal pay. It's now more than six years since the predecessor mm. committee started to look at this yeah. in the BBC. Um, last June, you told us there were eight equal pay cases open internally within the BBC. What's the number now? Yeah, so, um, yes, that's correct. Last year we did say there were eight pay cases, equal pay cases. So we've currently got 17 pay cases open. So that's one in a thousand employees. We have 17,000 employees at the, at the BBC. Over the last few years, we've continued to have small numbers relative to the overall population of our employee base. Of those 17 pay cases, 11 of those are equal pay cases. And the eight pay cases that you refer to from the last time we were here have all been closed. Were they settled in court, out of court, by negotiation? Did they cost money? We have a, we have a, a, re, a range of um, outcomes. Sometimes they they um, um, are not concluded, and, and they're effectively the complainant will remove them. Sometimes they need to be settled. How Sometimes many of those eight were removed? I don't I don't know the, the number. I was just giving you a range of options or outcomes that could happen. We may, we may absolutely settle a number of them, and then some may end up in an employment tribunal. That's correct as well. So if we move on to, um, which has been mentioned briefly, the uh, the demise of the news channel um, uh, last year, and I want to ask you this, Tim. Um, you know, at the time, I was yeah. fairly straightforward in what my view on that decision was. That yeah, it was a disaster. Um, I would suggest that I've been proven to be right. It has been a disaster in terms of news coverage. Um, in the UK. The Nicky Campbell thing that you said was going to be the best thing that could happen basically. Paraphrasing, but we had a backwards and forwards on that and I said, well, it's not news. And you said it was. It was cut in October to half the time because it didn't work. Um, But if we link this to equal pay and the position of women presenters, news presenters in your organisation, there are, I think, five being on garden leave for the best part of a year. Um, I'm not sure exactly what those presenters pay. We know what pay ranges they're in. Um, so we're talking about a million and a half pounds of um, taxpayers' money for really high-quality mm. news presenters. Mm. Um, what's happening with those women? Where are, where are they going to end up? Well, again, I, I remember our uh, discussion um, last time we were, we were here, and um, We've, we are working through to reach a fair resolution, and I think um, that's, what, that's what we're trying to do in terms of people applying for roles, getting uh, appointed. So that's what we're... we're I, I'm cautious because I, I obviously yeah. we're into individual cases, but, but uh, clearly we don't want to be... We, you don't want to be in a position where you're paying people um, who are not working. That is not ide- you know, far from ideal. So I think we're in a position where we're getting to a point where... We but they're not working the through no fault of their own, through an organisational change that you decided on, you looked at. It, this didn't happen overnight. This would have been looked at for at least months before this happened. And yet we're a year on and these things still aren't resolved, which is not really a very good place to be. Um, what's morale like amongst news, women news presenters in your organisation? Well, I think, you know, again... When I get asked for morale, it's it's difficult because I think it depends on the individual and where they are in processes, and you can talk to different uh, people within the newsroom in ge- who have in different general, views. The, the women news presenters on well, that, any well, of that the group. Programs. Are you talking about that group or yes. you, that specific group? Not just the the women affected by this, but no, I, the, the women who present 
news programmes across your national output? Uh, across all national output? Yeah, well, th then I think you, you, you would be mixed. You'd have different views from different people. What I do think, and it relates to the comments that we had last time, which, which I, I took, you know, it's under, it is not a good situation where, you have, you're, where you're paying people and you're trying to get that resolved. We are trying to get it resolved as fast as possible, and I recognise it's been going on for some time. Mm. Absolutely. I would suggest that morale from the people I speak to and I speak to many of your women broadcasters um, and have done for years now since this all started um, because I think I'm one of the few people on the committee, John, yeah. was here who were involved yeah. when it all um, started. Um, and I would suggest morale it goes every month is worse than the month before and I wouldn't have thought that was possible. So I think your view of it being mixed is not the view I get. But going back to this channel that replaced mm. the news channel if we look at what it's doing now compared to what it was doing when it started almost a year ago it is doing more news than it was I think because <laughs> it wasn't working it was never going to work with the format you suggested it, we've we've already been asked questions about this coming year it's not just elections in this country we've got European elections we've got the American elections there's elections I've never known a year like it for elections um, Inevitably, the news coverage will increase during that period, I would have thought. Um, and I think we're looking at a programme that is shifting more to what we had before the 1st of April last year. Um, and you've still got all of these women not placed. Do you think that's going to pose you potential problems? I think we need to resolve the last issue as quickly as possible. And I, 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 I take your comments in terms of that has taken a long time to resolve. Mm. I think it's it's we are we and the team are trying to act fairly as they can and, and work through that. And I take the, I take your feedback on the new channel itself. I think um, I remain convinced that on the budget problems we have to have one news oper have two completely separate organisations was the wrong thing. So that's where I con continue to hold ground on that. We did, to be fair, and, and I, I take your points, but we, we did, to be fair, said we would take stock, see how it's going, make some adjustments, things work, things don't work. I think as the, I mean, we've said very publicly, you know, we've got um, a single fee, but we can also go to different streams. And I think this will put some pressure on us this year to make sure that you're keeping relevant, and it's clearly important to have our international news. The last quarter of 23, we still reached 6 million people, so that's an important thing, but that was up 20% on the previous quarter. And we remain in our leading position in news, and also globally, I think we've never been more important. I mean, there's a whole separate question I've got on the World Service funding, which if I had concerns, that would be top of the list, to be honest. But the, um, the answer to your question is, I think we're going to have to, you know, make sure that organisation uses those, you know, separate live stream operations when it needs it and, and basically gets it right through these people. I, I haven't got a lot to add in terms of your challenge apart from we, I think we can meet it. We, you know, it, it is looking much less likely that there's going to be a general election in this country in May. There are still a few days I think it could be announced. That's but, one thing I won't speculate but, on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I think, you know, the, the, the mood music is that we think we're looking at a later point but we know there's a general election in this country sure. by the end sure. of January next year. And yet, you still don't seem to know how this channel is going to work in a general election when we could have potentially been in a general election. But we'll, we'll make sure we've got week. the right level of UK ops. And also, I, I come back to my point as well, which is we also have, ex in terms of election coverage, I don't think you're, you're going to have a problem. We're, we'll be heavy on BBC. We'll, you know, <coughs> we, we have an outstanding team. And then online coverage will be huge. And then I think the channel will do its business. And I think we've got to get that right. There's, I, think, I think that's just part of managing the day-to-day -day operation of the BBC. It sounds very um, loose to me. But if we go back to the position of women news broadcasters in your organisation and the position of equal pay claims, so it may be small numbers that are in train, but they've gone up quite considerably from the numbers you gave us last year. 8 to 17 is quite a big jump. Are we, are we talking about equal pay? Equal pay. Yes, yes. Yeah. sorry, just want to get clear. Um, so we've gone up from 8 to 11 equal pay because okay. we have 17 pay so You've still gone up. Um, this is when we've been told repeatedly in this committee that, you know, all the processes are in place, All the, and there has been major moves forward in a lot of areas. I don't think you've still got the higher areas right 
where these pay bands don't really apply to. Um, however, your equal pay cases going up, equal pay cases in workplaces are quite uncommon when you've had such an intense focus on, on equal pay in an organisation and such a massive change in, um, in, in pay structures to try and avoid such things, yes. and yet the number of cases are still coming in and are still coming, going up. Why is that happening, but, Tim? Well, to be fair, 11 out of 18,000... I just want to set that perspective, because that is important. Every case is an issue. I've got it. I've got it. You shouldn't but, be having any But we should know. No, I understand that, and whether what the norm is or what, you know, the rounding error of one or two cases, I've got no idea what, what would, uh, in terms of how low you can, you know, can you get to zero? Of course we should be trying to get to zero. I do think we've made enormous progress, to be fair. I mean, I think, much, yeah. I think, you know, we have the pay bands now. I mean, we have structure. We have a really clear structure. Well, can I ask a question? The, the employees that those pay bands refer to, how many equal pay cases have you got in those? Well, every, um, every employee other than the executive is assigned to a pay band. Every employee across the BBC. So all, Including all, all presenters? Yes. So only the executive don't have a, have a pay band. So all employees have a pay band. That career path framework is visible to all employees. You can see where you are in that pay band relative to others in the pay band. So the transparency that we've put in place yeah, is, 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 well, all is the, better all the than any pay claims outstanding in those pay bands, or are some of them at executive level? I'm not aware. Of, I'm not personally not, aware of any. Exactly, when you say executive, you're talking a tiny, a tiny group. Is is I, I'm not aware of any. Um, but the the so I think it's all in people in pay bands. So the pay bands have now been there for four years, five years. How are you getting equal pay claims now after four or five years of those bands being in place and the amount of energy and and uh, scrutiny that you're uh, employees have gone under to make sure that they're on the right place in the right bands. How are you still getting equal pay claims? Well, I think in, in large organisation with thousands and thousands of people, and we have one in a thousand pay cases being raised, which could be a variety of things, they're not necessarily equal mm -hmm. pay. So I think any organisation is always going to have a small number. I think it's really important that we manage the structures that we've put in place. We have to watch. We have to watch. But we have a number of additional things. So along with the structures, we have exceptions committees. So anything, any pay award that's made out of the out of alignment, whereas exceptions, we have senior leaders who review those and approve them. So we have monitoring at that level. It's also man monitored at our REMCO, so our remuneration committee at board. So that's important too that we have board oversight. We also do an um, equal pay audit, independent equal pay audit. So you'll remember we had the Equalities and Human Rights Commission work. Which is exactly, that gave us this is exactly my point, though. You have all of these processes now. You've, the organisation under yourselves and previous people mm. who've been to this committee have had this under <coughs> a magnifying glass for more than six years. And what I'm struggling with, although it's small numbers, if we were looking at an organisation who hadn't done all of that, then 11 in however many thousand is not huge. But when you've had all of that and you've got all of these processes, how is this still happening? These are cases. They're not, we haven't, they're, they may or may not be valid at this point. We're, we're looking, but if you've got 18,000 people, so I do come back to it because it is material, this, in terms of you're going, you know, you've got a very, very small group of people who legitimately can ask a question that says, based on my pay in the band, I can see... Is it due to gender in any way? So, now, I don't believe we're in a position <coughs> where we, we aren't, you know, sorry, we are in a position where I believe we're delivering rationally equal pay now, um, flawlessly across the organisation. Eight cases that are now settled one mm. way or the other. How many of those were found to have a valid equal pay claim? I'd, I'd have to provide that information to you separately. I don't have right to Yes, of course, that. I'd be absolutely Thank happy you. to do that. Thanks, Julie. Um, uh, Lee, what's the gender pay gap at the BBC? Our gender pay gap at the moment is, um, um, in our last reported numbers, sorry, let me just remind myself, um, in, which was 22-23, the financial year, our median gender pay gap was 7.3%. How does that compare to uh, the last two or three years? Is it getting better or worse? 
So we have we saw we have seen improvements in the in the gender pay gap. In, as far as I'm aware, the, the lowest that we reported recently was at five percent. So that was an, an increase. There are some really specific reasons why the gender pay gap will move in, in line with any of our other. Sorry, well. I did, that wasn't clear. Is it is is the gender pay gap today better or worse than it was two years ago? So I, I, my expectation is that we will see that pay gap around seven percent, but it may increase. Yes. But as this figure you've just told me, 7.3% was it you just told me, is 7.3% gender pay gap higher or lower than... It is higher than it was reported in 21-22, so that was the comment I made. So in 21-22 we reported a gender pay gap of 5.9%, yeah. and in 22-23 we reported a pay gap of 73 but there are, there are really specific reasons why a pay gap will move, and I think it's really important that we understand that. Tim's talked a lot today about our apprenticeship programme. Now, in our apprenticeship programme, we will find across all of, all of our pay gaps, so we look at, we actually report on all of them, not just gender, so we will report on other pay gaps as well. Our apprenticeship cohort will reflect a different bias on a different diversity mix than our general population. And of course, remember, most apprenticeships will come in at entry levels in a role. So when you're talking about a median pay gap and you're bringing in more diversity at more entry levels, that median pay gap will increase. We've also done a number of other specific interventions as well. So we've been looking at pay progression. That's really important. We've been talking about the career path framework and how employees move through that career path framework and through the <coughs> range as well. So we have made a number of specific interventions to directly address where we weren't seeing employees progress through that. And that specifically has targeted populations, long-standing employees who have maybe been at the lower end of a pay range, and we felt that it was important that we could demonstrate they were moving through the pay range. That has had itself an impact on the median pay range. And then one other example which was impacted on gender is we have seen, of course, in a high inflation environment, we've seen high demand and high salary <coughs> requirements on specific types of skills, particularly in the, uh, technology, software engineering as we drive digital. That has meant that we've had to increase salaries specifically for those populations to meet industry demand and ensure we can retain that talent. It's fundamental to our, to our digital um, strategy. And of course, that population generally, whilst we work incredibly hard to increase the number of women who are in technology and STEM roles, are biased more towards men. So when you're making targeted pay interventions like that, that impact on a type in an area where the industry balance is not equal across men and women, you will also see an impact. So I think we, that it has gone up, as, as you've rightly asked me. I think we are very clear about why it's going up. And that's really important, so we understand that. And I think the real question for us continues to be, how do we support apprentices and new people coming to the organisation flow upwards through the, through the organisation and, of course, move into more leadership positions? Because that also impacts pay gaps. So the more senior mix you have in leadership positions as well, that will also support. So I think we, are, we manage it well. It goes all the way through our governance. It's regularly reviewed at our remuneration committee and oversight by the board. Um, but... But, but yes, it has it has gone up, but I think for reasons that are really explicable and, and, and we're comfortable with. If I may, it's quite interesting. This is a real... I'm just, I'm just grateful for the explanation. Yeah, it's a really... pay gap works when I was the minister that Sorry. put through the, the legislation, but thank you. It's a yeah. really big debate for us because we're still well ahead of most uh, other players in the market. So as my, my, my kind, of, kind of discussion with Lee and others is actually what we don't want to do is things that are counter... Not actually, they're, they're not logical and they're counter common sense just to maintain it at five when actually getting women in, more women into the apprenticeship scheme may, may, may in the short term move your gap a little bit in the context of being well ahead. Now, the other thing we're quite obsessed by, and we're all over this, is the pay gap by band, which is much lower than the average. It's, the maths is kind of weird, but that's how it works. So we're looking at that all the time, because I think that number in some ways, as well as the headlines, obviously important, but the number within band is important, and that, that gives us some reassurance. It also gets to the earlier questions, and a, a very valid questions around equal pay and making sure that's all being, yeah, it's, there, there are other metrics that we can look at in that context. So that's where we are. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think we just witnessed uh, BBC splaining. If we can, if we can coin, if we can coin a new uh, a new phrase, but I'm glad you've been brought up to date. And thank you so much. I know I was the pay gap yeah. uh, means. 
Um, uh, uh, good afternoon. Um, uh, Director General, could I just uh, update myself on what the total cost of the lawyers now is for fighting women on equality? I think in your last couple of appearances you've update as a, updated us on the eye-watering figures. So what's the latest? I'll need to bring that information back. And I'm, more than happy I'm sorry you didn't bring that because I, I do raise it every time, so it's not an unexpected question. But it was well over a million um, the last couple of times you've told us. And just to confirm, you haven't won a single case against a single woman. Every case has been either settled or lost. Is that correct? We have only ever lost one case, um, but we have settled. Or you, you've, you've settled, you've settled or, or lost, exactly, as I, as I said. Um, on the question of the gender... Pay gap, however, uh, you've explained to the Chair that uh, the gender pay gap has increased. Um, and you said it was because lots of uh, younger, more junior people were moving in. Worth pointing out, however, that the pay gap has also increased amongst BAME people uh, as well, and also amongst LGBTQ plus people as well. So in each of these groups, it's increased. And I see from your nod that you're confirming that. Um, Director General, can I just say, you said something that really uh, pleased me earlier on, which was, you said uh, we should be kind. And I just thought that was striking. You don't hear that often enough in, in politics. And I think kindness is immensely important. Mm -hmm. And in the debate that we were having, and I, it frustrates me that it's called a debate because it's actually about human rights. Um, you know, I get contacted a lot Indeed. by trans people who just tell me how distressing it is to have their very identity attacked all the time. In fact, somebody just came up to me recently in the street and said, thanks for standing up for us, because we just feel so embattled. This was a, a young girl. So I think it's worth remembering that there are people uh, here, and they're not just political uh, pawns. Mm -hmm. And thank you for acknowledging that. Thank you. Um, black people within the BBC are leaving at higher rates than they join. Isn't that correct, Mr Davey? Um, have you got the... No, I, don't know, I, don't we don't, I, I haven't got the numbers in front of me in terms of BME um, departures versus hires. Um, for fear of BBC splaining, can I give a little bit of context on that in terms of where I think we're at? Which is, I think when I set the diversity targets of 50, 2012, now 25, we can talk about the 25, that's socio-economic diversity. It was actually, and you talked, we talked about improving the BBC, and I know, you know part of that is across the UK as well, but we wanted a more diverse population. And that is I, <laughs> dangerous territory, but I didn't see that as particularly uh, progressive with inverted commas around it. I thought it, saw it as just the right way for an organisation that represents all of the population to do its business. Within that, if you, if you look, Mr Nicholson, over the overall, my tenure, we're now at over 17% BAME population, which is a really great achievement, by the way. Show me an organisation that's made that progress. The second is we have in senior management, and this was the thing that was really animating me, if you want to know, which is that not enough senior black Asian minority ethnic leaders, it's because my personal view is you can have as many people in the organisation, but if you can't see them at a senior level and say people, so I could now list you a number of very senior black leaders in the organisation and ethnic minority leaders in positions of serious power. That Please, we're going to return, we're going to return, now, we're now, going to return what to this. Is happening, what is happening is I think there is a challenge with retaining very high potential and good BBC trained BME colleagues. But it's not just... Uh, people at that level who are leaving. So I put out a call for people... I'm talking about all levels on that. My right. point was not about the senior levels. It was, okay. just, it was all I levels. I put out a call um, for people to contact me, and it's a useful, ex yes. a useful exercise. And I can tell you that most members of the public approached me and asked me to ask you questions about um, local radio, which has been covered, yeah. and bias, yeah. which has been covered. But BBC staff sent me direct messages, and I can tell you what the issues were overwhelmingly. I got a completely disproportionate number of messages from BAME members of staff, disproportionately from, uh, from women, and the issues that they wanted me to raise with you were diversity, equality, and the issue of bullying. Um, so I'm going to quote some things. They've all asked me 
not to say who they are, uh, but um, I'll, I'll quote some of the things that people have said to me. Here's one quote. Diversity at news editor level is non-existent. Some areas have not employed a black person for decades. Please ask the Director General if he's been contacted by black staff who've expressed their unhappiness and feelings of discrimination. To which the answer is? Um, I've, no, I've got no doubt that over three years I will have received emails from BME staff and, and meetings raising issues and I've met I think, I, I think you've had but, but I've met with I mean Miss, Miss Nicholson you're talking to someone who was the executive sponsor of you know the BAME network I mean Embrace have, to, have, have, have actually spent enormous time on this so and do we still have areas of challenge of course we do and if you ask 20,000 people as I know you do and I respect the process uh, you will get different versions of you know, people's experiences within the BBC, There's inevitably. Okay, here's someone else. I'm not dismissing we're, them, I'm just, I'm just saying how you deal with them. Yes, here's, here's somebody else. We're woefully behind our diversity targets. No black or Asian manager exists in many areas, uh, nor, uh, and they tend to be mostly in black-led areas, like uh, the music station Radio One Extra. Uh, diversity pay gaps, um, have grown, as, as we've established. Um, and this person said to me, I'm leaving, I'm tired of uh, struggling and fighting. Um, here's someone else who says, um, if the Director General says he doesn't have a problem with sexism and bullying, um, please reinforce to him that we were very optimistic as uh, women and as black women, we were optimistic when he started. We feel that he does believe in equality. He's just not delivering it. There's some more. I'd just like you to respond. Um, well, I'm always, it's always actually, I, I just, it's always upsetting when you hear someone in our organisation who feels that. That's how I respond to it. I think overwhelmingly I am... You know, there is no doubt that if you ask an organisation of 20,000 people of the, of the nature of the BBC, you are going to get you are going to get different views. I have to step back and say a couple of things. Do we have the right set of values and culture setting it from the top and my management? And I think we do. Second thing, bear, bear with me. You've asked me the question. How yep. I respond? The second thing is, do we have the processes by which people can speak up? And what actually, if you want to know, my actually <laughs> one of my responses is. We need to get as an organisation to a point where raising it in direct message to yourself, this is with the greatest respect, that they have the confidence in the organisation because that's the success for me. That's the other reaction I've got. All right? and, and one individual is one too many. The next point, sorry, and then I'm done with my BBC explaining, um, is I would say, I, the point I would push back on a little bit is the number of black and Asian, uh, British Asian, ethnic minority leaders we have. S you know, Chief Financial Officer of BBC Studios, Financial Director, Finance Director of BBC News, Head of Music, um, music across Radio 2, Radio 1, running the whole show, not just um, uh, niche services. Fantastic executive. Head of Radio 4 and All Speech Radio. There's loads. I could go on, by the way. I could go on. There is loads of people now. Now, there are certain areas where I'd like to see better. And the other thing we've done is in, for every senior manager, if, if I employed you, Mr Nicholson, as a senior leader in the BBC you are now assessed every year against your delivery against those targets. We are not woefully behind, by the way. We're, we're, we're broadly on track. We're now an organisation that's in majority women. You know, in terms of women, they're over 50%. We're now at 17% and broadly on track on BAME. You know the number I'm most worried about is people with disability. That's the one that's hard to move. And on socioeconomic diversity, we're at 21.1 in the last report, and I need to get to 25. That's, yes, how gonna, uh, that's the facts. I'll read you one of those ones uh, in just a second, but you said that you wished that people had the confidence to come to you and talk about it, and obviously I'm pleased... Well, many do, many I, do. I, I'm sure they do, but I'm pleased that people have the confidence of course, to write of to us uh, or, or, uh, uh, and to know that their confidentiality will be respected. But here's one who said to me, um, in many ways the situation has uh, worsened if we raise certain issues like bullying, the bullying gets worse. And in fact, those of us speak out um, about discrimination, uh, this is another uh, BAME person, 
says, we find that our careers get affected if we speak out. Yeah, well, clearly that would be totally unacceptable, so that person is, yeah, that individual we need to support and hopefully they'll feel the confidence to come back and get the, come into the system and get support. I can't really add much as you in these individual cases because, as I say, if you, you know, I have to look at the overall staff server, you know, how we're doing, talking to the groups, talk, engaging with Embrace and the other staff networks. They're the kind of things you do to change I, I promise I won't quote things to you, and that's course, what I'm doing. Of course, that's uh, what, on the issue of class, yes. quote, as someone whose contract with the BBC ends in a couple of weeks, I've no idea for the first time in my 10-year career where my next paycheck will come from. Mm. I'm working class. The media wasn't easy for me to get into. I don't have any safety net. It's scary to think that the media industry, especially the BBC, can be run by the elite who can take several months without work until the drought dies down. I'm not in that position. Yeah. I, I think we've got, there's a big industry problem here. Um, and I think, I, if you haven't read the Bechtel report on freelancers, by the way, I really recommend it. Um, it's a sobering read. 68% of freelancers aren't in work at the moment. This is really worrying. And to your point, I think that really puts pressure, particularly on people without the, you know, the obvious. But if you're a young person and you're able to live at home or you've got more resources. So I think things are stacked against people. Um, in a way that is problematic, just being very direct with you. So I care about that, and it's difficult. The, the thing the BBC is doing is it, is it is trying to be a supportive employer. You know, frankly, I think the BBC is at the good end of the market in terms of being supportive of people. We have a raised network where we talk about it. Certainly, I don't consider myself and the senior executive to come from backgrounds with silver spoons emerging from our mouths. Uh, yeah, I, I, I really don't think that's the case. And we've also, if I may, we're one of the only organisations... I mean, there's, a, there's a handful that have set a socio-economic diversity target. If you're interested in this area, I mean, we, I mean we, and that's been punchy. So, so we've set the target. I think if I, if I was prioritising the issues, though, I'd go on the wider industry. I think how we support uh, the continue, you know, all those those work, workers. It's it's always been an industry in certain pockets, not so much in journalism and your background, but but in producing in dramas and others where it can be a quite a transient, slightly exposed lifestyle in terms of where you get your next work from. I think there is some pause for reflection for the industry to think about how we navigate the next... Um, two two programmes I, I care about a lot in particular. One's Newsnight, which I, I worked on. The mood is bleak in, in, in Newsnight. And the other one's The Nine, because I argue very strongly for a separate Scottish Six. And The Nine was the consolation prize everybody knew at the time, put it on that channel at that time of night, its viewing figures aren't going to go do well. When you wanted to defend the programme, you argued on a corporate basis it was doing incredibly well and doing much better than Sky. And then when you wanted to get rid of the programme, you said it's not doing at all well and therefore we've got to uh, get rid of it, all of which was, was very, very BBC. I'd like, I'd like at this point to say, incidentally, that one of the stars of the show, Nick uh, Sheridan, young broadcaster in his early Absolutely. 30s, tried, died tragically. Indeed. Uh, and um, I'd like to offer my uh, condolences uh, to him and his partner. And thank his, you very much for that. He was, an, he was an outstanding colleague, and I know he'll be sorely missed, and I know you've been... I wish um, I'd known him. Uh, um, you know, I've, I've seen his videos uh, playing music, and he just seems like just... The, the nicest... Uh, yeah, he'll, be, he'll be sadly missed, and I and, appreciate and the words. Kindest, so, and kindest guy. Very much. Um, Two just very quick questions before I finish, because we're out of time. At Newsnight, mm. uh, the staff at Newsnight think that uh, you're getting ready to cut them by another 10 minutes down to 30 minutes. They're already feeling very depressed about the programme. They miss the filmmaking. The programme's not what it was. Uh, is that true? Are you going to do that after the May elections? Um, it's, not a pla it's not a plan that I've got in front of me, no. I mean, that's, that's for the news, news and BBC One and others to propose if and when, but that's not, that's not a plan I've seen. On the issue of being kind, are you mm. going to bring Hugh Edwards back? I'm definitely, you know, I'm not going to comment on an individual case, you know that. And I think um, all I would say is we've just got to get through um, the process fairly with, you know, with, with the right values. and He's done and, anything and wrong that I can see. I'm not going to be, you, you, I'm not going to talk on a specific it's in his case. Contract. It it's in his contract he gets to uh, present the elections. I know you're in a bit of a state 
worrying what you're going to do at the next elections. Do you bring him back? Probably not. But what do you do about his contract? You don't have anybody else lined up. You're thinking about all sorts I, of different I, I, people. I don't recognise for a minute being a bit in a bit of a state. I mean, I might be in, well, a, bit of, was, but I might be in a bit of a state on a few things, but that ain't one of them. Was, I, mean, I, I, I tell you one thing. Th- I, I, I don't know. I don't I will. I, will, I, look, I think everyone re- re- realising that realises that a working through the process fairly and judiciously is the right thing to do and not comment on individuals in this way. And that's got to be the right thing. Talking about kind, that would be the kind thing to do, I think. Well, I just want to express support uh, for, uh, for Hugh Edwards because uh, I can't see what he's done wrong. I know this is in his contract and I know he's going through a difficult uh, time in the public eye and I think... Uh, he deserves, uh, he deserves uh, support from colleagues and ex-colleagues, which I'm, I'm, I'm giving him here. Chair, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, John. And last but not least, Alex. Thank you, thank you. I'll probably be short as we're already into PMQs. Um, we're in the midst of a inquiry into film and high-end television yes, and the Select yes. Committee, so it'd be remiss of me not to ask you a couple of questions yeah. to aid our inquiry. Um, we've seen that the independent film sector in the UK mm. is, is growing Real. but struggling. We've just had the really welcome intervention by the Treasury of the, the new tax credits for smaller films under yeah. £50 million budget. But how does the BBC support independent British film mm-hmm. through your commissioning or through the acquisition of independent British films? Well, I think you've, you've heard evidence, I think, from did you, for uh, Eva Yates, our, our outstanding um, leader of our film, uh, you know, a work in film, and I think, um, as you know, it's very tough. You know, if you're an independent filmmaker, raising the finance is brutal at the moment. And I just want to be um, uh, 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 echo what you said, which is getting the tax credit is incredibly important, and it is proven in, in this industry to really turbocharge a sector, so or safeguard a sector. So one, that's good news. The second is, I think, local storytelling is so important, and actually, us protecting together independent British film is critical to our culture. Now, the BBC, I mean, I think you've been given evidence, so I'll try not to take long, because I know there's other stuff going on outside this room that may be more interesting, but um, I think you've heard a lot of evidence. You know, we have a small budget. We're not going to... I cannot deficit fund films, and we can't make that business work. So suddenly we're not going to say 200 million of the licence fee, I've got enough problems in terms of working out. We're going to make films. But what we can do with that 11 million that we, we do is absolutely be catalytic in terms of making projects happen, being the first, if you like, domino, and I think we do that brilliantly. That is our role. On the, commission, on, the, on the buying side, it's a market, and then there are people concerned about rates, but at the end of the day, it's a competitive market once you've got a finished film. The problem is, I think, really about getting the financing at the front, front end, and that's a really deep problem, and the BBC can play its part. It can absolutely be part of... I think if you go to investors with the BBC attached to a film... It can absolutely help. That's that's our role. That's our role, as opposed to deficit financing, where we just can't. I'd soak up all the budget. Um, you know, uh, the budget of local radio and a few other things we care about would be gone in one movie. Uh, I've been visiting BBC World Service twice recently, and I think they do such an important Amazing job globally. Job, yeah. We're at a time with the rise of autocracy, and, 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 and democracy is at a really strained point. The media have got a really important role to play in that. And so, for instance, we haven't had an Albanian service since 2011. The Russian service now is is internet only. I understand some technical difficulties there. But it's so important that that, that communities like those and many other parts of the world can turn on their radio and hear the BBC because the media sources they're getting in their own countries are not just biased, but are full of misinformation and disinformation. Um, What... What could we do? Well, we're, we're we're done to well I think there's two things. There's, there's, the the, firstly, the World Service is utterly critical. It's one of the, one of the great national treasures. And, as a, as a, and it's not just historical. It's, our, it's more needed now than ever. And if we need to look and invest in our soft power, bluntly. The problem is we haven't inve- increased it. I mean, we have kept our 254 million or whatever the number is. We're very, very grateful for the 103 or odd uh, the, uh, that's coming from... Um, government, but at the end of the day, we're going to we cannot be in a position. If I started cutting services, domestic services, we are heading for a big decision on the world service and how we fund it. I just put that marker down. Mm. In the short term, we have an agreement with the foreign office in terms of, and thank you know, we do get the investment and we've been able to protect the language services. But there is a bigger question about the world service that's coming fast, 
and I think we all need your support. So thank you for your kind words. Good. Thank you very much, Alex. Well, that's, you're off the hook. Thank you very much, uh, all of you, for your time and all your um, wide variety of evidence today. Thank you very much. Uh, we're really grateful for, um, for you taking the opportunity to give us uh, all your thoughts on a r range of different subjects. Order. Order. Pleasure.